So, are you start off or someone else is going to start? Allow, allow no me to, to, for allow me to introduce you. Please, it will be a pleasure. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we are here for the plenary session of our today international conference on uh, globalization and new terrains of consciousness, phenomenolo phenomenologies of the global, local and global. We are so delighted to have uh, Professor Shamabrata uh, with us and uh, Professor Manoj and Professor Joff. Uh, and uh, he's the chair, Shamabrata sir is the chair. He's the associate professor at the School of Arts and Aesthetics, Jawaharlal Nehru University. He has authored theater number event, uh, three studies on the relationship uh, between sovereignty, power, and truth, and articles on ancient Greek liturgy, the staging of Ibsen, psychoanalysis, Nietzsche, Schiller, and Hegel. He uh, is also the author of Ambedkar and other immortals and untouchable research program. His latest book is now, It's Come to Distances, Notes on Coronavirus and Shaheen Bagh Association and Isolation. Uh, over to you, uh, uh, sir. Please, please kindly introduce the speaker and take it. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very kind of you to invite me uh, to this session to, to, to do, do this. I'm really happy to welcome all of you uh, to this plenary session. Uh, we have two uh, wonderful speakers today. Uh, so we go uh, in a certain order, which uh, is already uh, decided. Uh, so um, the two speakers are Professor Joff Bradley and uh, Dr. Manoj uh, Manu and um, let me let me start with the first speaker for the day, and then uh, the second will come to after the end of the presentation and the questions for the first speaker. Uh, so um, Professor um, Joff Bradley uh, teaches at the um, Department of English and Foreign Languages. Uh, and uh, at the Taikyo University in Tokyo, in Japan. He's also, uh, he's also a visiting professor at the Jamia Millia uh, University, and he's a research fellow at the Kim Hu University in Seoul. And his presentation today is called uh, Portal Front Wound, Three Metaphors to Explore the Planetary Crisis. So 30 minutes uh, um, to speak. And then 10 minutes of presentation is 10 minutes of discussion is how I understand the session is to be structured. So may I uh, invite you, uh, Geoff Bradley, to make your presentation. I have a PowerPoint. So is it presumably it's OK for me to uh, to share? Is that of course, of okay? course. This is the one, I think. Uh, you can see my slide, presumably? Yes. Oh, excellent. Okay, well, I'll, I'll begin then. Um, uh, you know, thank you really so much for letting me uh, join you, you know, uh, today. I wish, of course, I could be back in Delhi. I was, uh, it's um, just over a year since I was last there for uh, six weeks. Um, with Manoji and uh, Professor Daz and um, my colleague Tai Kwang Lee in, from Korea. So I really miss the place and I'm dying, dying to get back. So, um, yeah. So anyway, um, I'll, I'll begin because um, I ended up writing a lot for the presentations, more than 9,000 words, which I, I sent. And it came out like this, it came out with three metaphors. It could be a million others, of course, but the three metaphors, as you can see on the screen, are the portal, the front and the wound. And I guess I was trying to use them to think about the, the crisis, the planetary uh, crisis. So I, I was thinking about the planetary crisis in terms of a phenomenology of, of violence, and the question of uh, disorientation and disruption. So I was trying to think about it in that way. But then I got very, um, I got very apprehensive when I uh, saw um, the call for papers, very expansive call for papers. And I thought, oh my goodness, how am I, <laughs> am I going to uh, say anything kind of uh, uh, meaningful about, about such a, you know, a wide ranging uh, call for papers. And so I kind, of, I kind of boiled down what I wanted to say in terms of these, um, in terms of these uh, concepts, 
One is phenomenology, which I know something uh, about. The other one is new trains of consciousness, which I got um, very apprehensive about. The other one is um, mondialization or world making. And then thinking about those in terms of the planetary imaginary and then and trying to come up with some kind of criticism of, of what the post-human is. So I think if I get to the end of my talk, then you should hear me criticizing the, the post-human kind of uh, worldview. So that's where I, I got, um, where I began. And so I, I began, with, I thought, my goodness, I'm going to speak in India. And then so I should really say something about, about India. So then I was reading uh, Arundhati Roy's uh, The Pandemic is a Portal, a very wonderful piece. And I thought, okay, I should use that. And I thought, okay, that's an opportunity for me. I should, I should use it. But then um, I came up against a piece by uh, Tela de Chardin um, on No Man's Land on, on the front. And it kind of, it threw that kind of, that metaphor of the portal in, in, into some kind of, uh, some, some kind of questioning. Because I saw in the portal, the idea of the portal, a kind of a sense making. And then thinking about what would come out of the, beyond the portal was a kind of a new terrain of consciousness, which was consistent with a call for papers. But then Tellard's work, um, Tellard's piece of writing, a nostalgia for the front, which he, he, drawing on his experience from the First World War, articulated a phenomenology of violence and that kind of upset it a little bit. So what I found in Tellard de Chardin's work was this idea of, um, of Zerezenheit, of torn to pieces hood, of absolute dismemberment. And I was thinking about the portal as it kind of, uh, uh, that would be like a, a closure from the tears and the lacerations and the rips from this, you know, you could say from the skin of the earth. And then I thought, okay, so the portal must be like a closure for that. But then Taylor seems to say something else and he, he says it like this. Um, he says it in terms of this idea of Zerezenheit. And he, it has a, a similar kind of, a kind of sense of this experience he has during the First World War with what William James had uh, during the uh, San Francisco earthquake in the uh, early years of the 20, uh, 20th century. And James has this, draws on Hegel's concept of the raisin hide, he calls it torn to pieces hood. And he says, in this experience of the trauma of the earthquake, okay, he says, he finds this, he finds a rapidity of improvisation, an order out of chaos, a pure delight and welcome, a passionate desire for sympathetic communication, a universal sense of cheerfulness, of steadfastness, steadfastness of tone. And he finds in the common man, okay, an admirable fortitude of temper. And this is William James, uh, the psychologist and philosopher speaking. So I thought, okay, well, it kind of throws, it throws that, uh, the idea of the portal into, into question. So I just tried to develop that a little bit more. And this is how, um, what came out of it. Um, this is what I found in, how I moved from the portal to the, the, the portal to the front and then to the wound, because this is what we find in, in Hegel's uh, phenomenology of spirit. And this is the kind of wound that uh, somehow heals itself and leaves no scars behind. And I thought, mm, maybe this is what the portal is, is trying to get at. This kind of uh, moving beyond kind of trauma and crisis where we heal and then the scars somehow uh, vanish. And then uh, there are two moves I'm going to get through in the talk. One is by way of Zizek, and then I'm going to turn to, uh, to Deleuze and uh, to Bernard Stiegler. And uh, Zizek says about Hegel's kind of description here about the vanishing of the scars. He says, you can't really do that, okay? He says, what we end up otherwise, we end up with this magical gesture of retroactive sublation, which is critical of. And I think that is what the portal seems to suggest. He says, 
rather than that, we have to think about the dialectic, okay, in the, in the phenomenon of the youth spirit as a kind of shift in perspective. So thinking about the pandemic as a kind of wound and about healing in some way, then we have to think about another standpoint uh, from it. Okay, so that's, that's where I got from the phenomenology, okay, from Hegel's uh, phenomenology of spirit. And that's where, how I kind of moved from the portal to the front or no man's land uh, and to the wound. That was uh, Zizek. I'm not going to dwell on uh, Zizek uh, so much. So I'm going to just turn to uh, Aaron Hachigoy and what Zizek says about the magical gesture of retroactive sublation. And uh, I kind of prepared this, okay, so we can just listen towards the last kind of comments in uh, Aaron Hattie Roy's the Pandemic uh, is a Portal. She says this, I do hope you can hear. She says this. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the I'll try again, sorry. of our prejudice and hatred. We'll try again. Hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world. Okay, so this is a very beautiful description of what the portal is, but I must admit I got rather irritated by it. Uh, this idea of yearning for a new kind of terrain of consciousness, this idea of passaging through the portal to mending somehow the torn skin of the earth. So what I took from the idea of the portal, it kind of jarred me into thinking about the idea of open uh, conflict. This is what the beautiful imagery, what Teilhard de Chardin, the Jesuit uh, priest and paleontologist, he experienced on the, the battlefields in World War I as a stretcher bearer. And he finds this idea of exploring the open wound because that, that, for me, was very, very interesting. And then this idea of the open wound allowed me to move to Deleuze, uh, Gilles Deleuze's idea of the wound, uh, something slightly different. And then thinking about Bernard Stiegler's interpretation of that, which I hope I'll get onto. And then uh, just to give you a hint about what Deleuze is kind of referring to, he's talking about the idea of, of an immanent possibility, a kind of question of pure immanence this pure immanence will be a sense of the open wound. And what I got from, I was up to there, that point, I thought I was being consistent, consistent in the logic. Then I needed my own voice. So then I was thinking about the idea of the planetary uh, commons, which I hope I'll be able to explain about. So I guess I kind of see the limits of the idea of the portal, uh, then, in Tellard's imagery of the front or no man's land, I saw this kind of affirmation of violence, affirmation of, a, of this world. It, it turns out to be quite Nietzsche uh, in the end, what Tellard de Chardin was writing about. But then there was a limit also to that phenomenological description of violence. And that's why I turned to, to Deleuze and the kind of stoic sense of pure immanence this kind of thinking about the battlefield or the open world or, or the open wound. And why? Well, because the plague, we can say the pandemic is a kind of plague, is actually, etymologically, it actually refers to the wound or to the strike. So that's how I was kind of playing with this idea of thinking about the, how one would affirm the pandemic by thinking about the sense of the wound. I guess my feeling was that in this description of the nostalgia, for this kind of, for the battlefield, as it were, in Tillard, there's a kind of, there is a Deleuzean idea of pure uh, immanence. So I guess what I was trying to, mm, what I was trying to say when I, when I wrote the paper was that it's not a question of kind of curing the wound, okay? It's not as simple as that. The portal is, seems to be a kind of, a kind of quick exit from that. And I wasn't happy about this idea of a transcendent portal this it's almost a seductive kind of portal idea. And I kind of was resistant to that. And I wanted to kind of think about how one would affirm the experience of a kind of violent laceration 
and perhaps even a persistent gaping wound, which I guess is the, the lot, which is of the human. And I guess I was trying to think about the, the escape from this idea of that one starts from a, a kind of pristine and perfect and untouched kind of whole, and then the tear comes after, or the, the laceration comes after. I was thinking, no, I can't. The, the move would be to, to think about an unoriginal tear. It's, the tear is already always there. And that means there can be no finality or closure, which is what um, which is what I guess the portal is trying to say. So just to turn to um, what Teilhard de Chardin uh, was saying, he was saying this, he says, those who have suffered uh, and, and died from uh, their suffering, from thirst or cold, no longer know how to forget the deserts or the glaciers where they have tasted the stoked drunkenness of being alone, not being there first. He says, it's in this manner and for this reason, ab above all, that I can no longer live without the front. So he, oddly enough, this thinker of the new sphere, of, of a, 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 a Jesuit, okay, he, instead of articulating a kind of theodicy, in the end, he, he experiences kind of affirmation of, of, of this the violent uh, laceration, which is, which is the front, and which is in no man's land, which is caring for those who have been mortally uh, wounded. So I thought that was extremely interesting. And then once I got into Teilhard de Chardin, I saw something else in his work. And he says this, this was his experience uh, with the North African uh, Suaves in, in Belgium uh, in the First World War. And he says, he says, I could finally plunge into the real without the risk of striking bottom and breathe the, in the earthly life with full lungs without worry that I would be lacking air. So it's a real affirmation of this kind of, of this experience of violence, which I thought was extremely kind of, Interesting. And then, okay, so why did I choose Tela de Chardin to speak about uh, globalization and, 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 you know, the kind of possibility of new terrains of consciousness? Well, it's because I was, I've been writing about the imam, that is the, the, the non-world, the, the unworld, the kind of filthy world, which you find explored by someone like uh, Jean-Luc Nancy. So in some ways, I was thinking about globalization, which has generated the imam, that is to say, the foul and the filthy world. And that would be the kind of, that would be a kind of imam which we experience now as a crisis, a kind of disruption. And again, this idea of Zerezenheit or torn to pieces hood. And that means, for me, that means how one would affirm that or extract from that sense of the imam the possibility of a planetary commons that's what i was that's the real goal of what I, I was i was thinking about all the time so how does one find the sense of the common in the no man's land okay in at the front rather than the portal but being at the front in no man's land and how one finds the idea of a planetary commons that that for me was extremely interesting and very, very important. But then the reply to that would be to say, okay, so, but you need the subject. So what is the nature of this subject in this moment of trauma and crisis? Well, for me, this idea of the portal being before the portal, right? That would suggest a kind of traumatized or frozen or petrified or inert subject. And I didn't want that. Okay, I kind of, that's another perhaps criticism of Arun Hati Roy's uh, metaphor, this kind of uh, wistful, kind of waiting kind of subject. I, I didn't want that. I wanted a vigilant subject in the here and now, in the present, experiencing the violent moderation and affirming it. And then oddly enough, I, my solution to it, my own self-criticism was to find uh, the Socratic figure, the uh, Parasiates, the one who speaks uh, the, the truth to power and risks all, because the, this is actually 
what Socrates uh, does as a soldier in the Peloponnesian War. He, he, he is there like Telad de Chardin. So he's a, he becomes this figure of, a, of the kind of vigilant subject. And I was very happy to find that kind of solution because it seems to me that the Parasiates, the one who practices telling the truth, would speak the truth of the moment. And then he would explore the kind of effect of the wounds of truth. This is what Foucault says. So then there would be a risk of being wounded. There a risk of being wounded by attending to those who are wounded, just like Tillard de Chardin did and, and Socrates uh, did. So that, that kind of helped me to help me to some ways to think about the front or no man's land as a kind of question of violence and war and rep reparations and, and, and also thinking about vulnerability and, and trauma. Right, so that, that is kind of where I got up to with the idea of the front, but then I needed to think about the wound uh, in some way. And I, I'm going to skip past this. I don't want to kind of dwell too much on it because, um, well, um, I, I, there were some things I extracted from this, which is to think about the idea of the pandemic as an event, that is to say, as a wound, that is to say, thinking etymologically about it being a plague, the wound and plague and event. And that is the wound which we must care for, which we must attend to. That means that in our no man's land, which we are at the moment, what the kind of conclusion I get to and I kind of jump to the conclusion and uh, just to give you a taste of it is that we have to return to the human, which is the sense of a fundamental wound of being human. That is, that allows me to escape thinking about the post-human or the transhuman or the extropian kind of uh, fet fetish, fetishized uh, affirmation of technology, which seems to be somehow beyond the portal. So, that would be to think the event as a plague and a wound and as a battle. And then we get in the logical sense, the Deleuze idea of thinking about this idea of pure immanence as a, something hovering over the battlefield, a kind of anonymous kind of uh, murmur almost over the, the battlefield. And that's, he finds in that, then he can think about the idea of something like the soldier, like th this would be Telad de Chardin's kind of soldier, okay, who he's there on the battlefield enduring uh, the horror of war, of violence, but all the time preparing to move beyond it, uh, be moving beyond the kind of courage and the sense of cowardice that you might feel. And then I guess this would be to kind of affirm the event somehow, the wound that one already um, that one or, or already has and one cannot escape from this essential uh, wound. And that allowed me, I guess, to think, mm, yeah, it, it, it would allow me to think about the possibility of ethics. So this is what I, what I derived um, from thinking about this idea of, of, of how one would kind of derive an ethics. So Tela de Chardin, his experience, his violent experience, as the Reznahai, torn to pieces, a radical direction, you would find a kind of ethics there. And that would be an ethics would mean to affirm that which happens to us, okay? To affirm that which uh, happens to us. And kind of, this is where I move on to Bernard Stiegler. Uh, because he helps me to think about the chance, which is an opportunity out of crisis, okay, the krenum, to think about affirming this opportunity, but without what well, seems to me the portal is a kind of transcendental imagery or transcendent imagery. And that the portal would be something that would kind of save us. And I don't, I'm not wanting to be saved. So this is where I'm kind of dogmatically Stieglerian because. Nothing saves us, but only that what we have to be worthy of, which is the wound of our lot. And then Stiegler will say, this is what is, this is what is uh, magnificent uh, in Deleuze, and I, I agree with him. 
Now, Stiegler in his later work begins to play with the idea of penser en penser. This is a penser would be to kind of um, to dress the wounds, okay? and penser would be to think. So that would be a question of healing the, in my interpretation, this would be healing the open wound, and there would be an ethics there. And, that, and, and healing the wound all the time, but not kind of seeking that radical kind of closure from it. And then again, to kind of back myself up here, as Stiegler says, it's not a question of optimism or pessimism, okay? But this is a question of fighting on the front line. You can see, I hope, the kind of how it resonates with those people who are sacrificing their lives at the moment to care for those who are chronically ill because of the coronavirus. This is Telad de Chardin's uh, experience as well on the front line. So he, he says this is a question of mm, this is a question of reason and of courage and of resolution, but of of dressing the wounds. Okay, and then thinking as if one, and this is the role of Parasiates or Socrates or the vigilant subject or the philosopher, this is thinking to, to act, to heal the wounds. And this is where I kind of get my, mm, this is where I kind of try to think about the, mm, the kind of community of resistance that would, might emerge from this kind of experience, this violent uh, laceration. This would be a kind of community of resistance suggesting, suggesting a kind of a new planetary imaginary. That would be my kind of conclusion would be the idea of a planetary uh, commons. So mm, let me just sum up what I kind of said. So as I said, I kind of had some questions about the portal and from my kind of serendipitous kind of reading of Tela de Chardin, it suggested the idea of a planetary no man's land. Okay, which is what we are in at the moment, I'm trying to argue. So then this nostalgia for the front um, would be a, a way to keep the tear or wound of this world open. This world would be an imand, an unworld, a, a, a kind of a vile world almost. But then there would be resistance to passing through it. Through it. Okay. So then there would be an idea of an indefinite openness, of, a community of resistance and a, maybe a kind of step towards this planetary no man's land. So I guess I was reading the phenomenology of violence, what I found in Tel Ad Shadan, idea of the no man's land or the front, in light of the sense making in the Roy's, Arun Hati Roy's sense of the portal. And I think that adequately kind of describes the emold of the moment, the non world we are at the moment, it's almost as if we're in a kind of suspension between this life and the next. And it's not even an existence almost, it's a kind of subsistence, because this again is a Stieglerian point, we are without future and without epoch. So this is kind of allowed me to dwell on this idea of experiencing a kind of violent laceration. And again, so I moved from the limits of this phenomenological analysis by Tela de Chardin, and I found in Deleuze, examination of the events, thinking the plague or the pandemic uh, as, a, as a wound or as a battle. And I thought this was consistent with the etymology of thinking the wound as a plague, or rather the plague as wound. And then this would mean, as I said, a kind of um, a, sus a suspension would be this kind of terror before the future, which is what Derrida kind of suggests about the future. A terror before the future, which is, if you think about the portal, we, we go through it kind of uh, um, ethereally almost, without this kind of terror of what is gonna come next. So I was kind of thinking about one needs to dwell in the wound and then, uh, my solution would be to think about Deleuze and pure immanence of the battlefield and thinking about um, the Heseity, the Don Scotus's notion of the thisness, which is you find a description of the battlefield in Deleuze like this. So, Benny, then, yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I'm afraid we're running out of time. So, if you could, could you give me uh, two, yeah. two minutes? <laughs> two, three minutes? Yeah, yeah, I've finished. I'm nearly done. So, two, three minutes. So I'm, I apologize. Oh, I thought it was on good timing, okay. 
So the the long to cut a long story short, I was thinking that this movement from portal to wound, uh, sorry, portal to front to wound, allowed me to return to the question of humanism, which is a kind of, uh, you know, we don't mention humanism nowadays, but I guess this would be a return to the uh, to the question of the human, and it would turn us to the question of the helmsmanship of the earth. Okay, uh, in this time of crisis, in this time of the wound, in this time of the plague, and I guess I was my, my kind of opposition to the kind of discussion about the post-human would be, I think that many young academics um, are kind of enthralled by online portals, by the kind of purveyors of the cybernetic becoming of the earth, uh, this kind of, uh, you could say, a kind of Telada Shadanian new sphere, a kind of skin of the earth, which would be healed or cured. And I was trying to write against that kind of algorithmic new sphere, right? I was kind of wanting to resist that. And I was wanting to question those who are kind of desperately, kind of frantically almost looking for glistening, pristine, chimerical uh, portals because they obviously don't exist. And I, I know this goes against maybe the mainstream thinking about the post-human or the transhuman or the extropian, but I wanted to kind of insist that we need a phenomenology of, of the imond, of the present. And that means phenomenology is all the more uh, pressing because we have 7 billion people on this planet and the nations and towns and uh, villages are kind of riven with conflict, with the wound, with crisis. And then... I think that there's no closure. The portal seems to give us a, a too quick kind of exit from that. And that, that for me would mean we, we, don't, we, we don't understand the wound, which is what we are. So then at the end, I kind of came back to a question of existential humanism really, and thinking about Sartre, thinking about that the duty of the intellectual vigilant subject is to take up the wound as it is, the, the wound that is the world, that is a stinking wound, a raw and putrid wound. And then, but all the time, we would have to attend to these wounds like Tela de Chardin and like Socrates. So then I wanted to think again, to conclude, thinking about the new terrain of consciousness that might, might come from this and thinking about the planetary imaginary, but then would be to leave you with the question, what will become of our planetary commons or planetary no man's land. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, can you put this on mute? Right? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Bradley. Uh, so, so what, what a fascinating range of uh, uh, thoughts, thoughts to, 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 to uh, really uh, you know, discuss. Though, well, we have uh, very little time, it seems. Mm, but but for a brief presentation, this was enormously rich. And uh, well, there are so many things that occur to me while, while listening to you. But before I indulge myself, I think I should perform my duties and 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 invite uh, interventions, comments, questions briefly, please. So, Professor Shomogrota and uh, Professor Bradley, we have a couple of questions here. Yeah, please. Yeah. You read them out and Professor yes. Bradley can answer yes, them. I'll do that. Shall I read them together so that uh, Professor... Yeah, I think that's, that's better. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Bradley, for that wonderful, wonderful lecture. I'm going to read together three questions that we have here for you. The first question is from Anna. And she says, of course, thank you for the lecture, Professor Chow. When Arundhati Roy says that the pandemic is a portal, it all seems too hinged upon an unforeseen circumstance or wound of our lot, as you say. How would you address this event in terms of our authority to deal with events that happen to us or how to prepare ourselves to be worthy or unworthy of that opportunity when and if it ever arrives? That's the first question. Professor Bradley. The second question is um, from Shatha. Um, she's asking if you have any thoughts on non-human players with respect to healing, particularly keeping the planetary imaginary in mind. 
The third question is from Professor Bahaduri, and he asks, what if the wound, the gaping wound is a portal, not to transcendently, ex to transcendently exit, but to enter further into the inards of what was visible so far, to plunge into the real, as Taylor would put it. What, what is, what if, I think he corrected himself as what if, right? What if Parisia needs not, need not happen only at the front, but in the inside of the wound? What if there is greater merit to keep the gaping wound alive as a perennial site of seeing and feeling the hurt, a perennial site of struggle, and not something that ought to be sutured and healed off? Mm. There are three questions for you. We have another question as well. So I think I think it's better to take these three together. I mean, that's that's a lot, no? Uh, for, <laughs> it is a lot. Yeah, that is a lot. There's a so, lot, yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, if that's all right, let's let's uh, first look at these three, and then if there's time, get on to the find the one more. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm kind of always dreadful with questions because they they always kind of <laughs> throw me to where I where I wanted to think about but preparation huh preparation for the event mm. well how can i explain it like this i was you know in in someone like a jesuit thinker like tela dashanda okay mm. yeah the, 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 usually we think about someone like Tela Dashada as always seeming to, yeah, always seeming to try to escape from this world. Okay. And um, somehow, yeah, that's right. Always trying to kind of thinking about escaping from this world, right? But then that wouldn't, you wouldn't be worthy of this world then, you see. If you were thinking about that particular reading of a kind of religious understanding of the transcendent, okay, of escaping the world somehow, um, that would not, according to a kind of Nietzsche logic or according to uh, Deleuze, that means we would not be, um, we, we couldn't be worthy of it. So the, the preparation, mm, the preparation for passing through the wound, right? Again, that wouldn't be an affirmation of uh, the world as it is. That wouldn't be that, that wouldn't be a kind of um, a struggle with the imand, with the non-world as it is. So my, my point about um, affirming the, the violence of our lot would would be about struggle for the like the, the commons, not to kind of <laughs> escape it. And then the healing again, the healing is not the, the healing is. We are not, we begin from a point of a radical tear, a radical laceration. So this, isn't, this idea of healing is profoundly a, a, a problem for me um, because, you know, the, the, the portal just seemed to suggest that when I looked at the kind of meaning of the portal, I was desperately kind of looking for the kind of description of, of what it is. It, it, it is definitely a kind of, a kind of, a kind of meniscus between this world and the next one passes through it and again that is not <laughs> that is not like um i don't i don't know how you want you would kind of get that uh, full idea of of healing from it. it the portal seems to me that when you pass through it that's where the healing begins when you when you've transcended it when you're beyond but no According to the reading I gave, and don't forget, Talad Deshadan is very, in this piece I chose, Nostalgia for the Front, is very different kind of understanding I have of his work now. So he kind of threw a lot of those concepts about the, of the wound, about healing into question. So I, mm, I don't think I answered all three of those questions, but that's, that's what I got to say. All right, great. Uh, so, uh... Maybe well, there was that fourth one that you were reading out. Uh, you could do that and be, be close with that. That fourth question that you started reading reading when I rudely interrupted you. Or uh, Professor Shomoroto, since we're running really short on time. Yeah. 
So you tell me. I request Professor Bradley to Bradley to answer those questions in the chat box. And yeah, sure. Yeah. Do you want to just finish reading that question since you started reading it? It's not nice to absolutely, absolutely. leave it hanging. Yeah. Yes. Just read okay. that question, even if. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is from Mohit. Yeah. Uh, he asks, "Hi, Professor Bradley. Regarding the truth-telling tendency you mentioned about Socrates and Tilardi Shadam." Can we say the vigilant observer who is attempting to establish a morality by virtue of the space he forces himself between himself and the crisis, a negative proof of his own virtue is offering an autonomous political solution for the planetary commons? Thank you. Right, right. So uh, uh, probably we won't have the time to discuss this last question, which is also a profound question. Mm -hmm. um, and now we have to get on to the next uh, the next speaker's presentation. Uh, just just one little thing, which which uh, always uh, in the last many months has always made me very curious about uh, something preliminary to to this fascinating discussion, which is the very word war. Uh, how far is war a metaphor, or how far war is the word for the real? Uh, that's something which which I am really. I've been curious about and have been thinking about. So, but then we don't have the time to get into that right now. But I thought I should, you know, just mention that. Um, so, so I'm very happy now to uh, to welcome uh, and invite uh, uh, Manoj, Dr. Manoj, and why I, I I in fact have known him as someone who is a passionate uh, uh, contributor to the to the Dallas movement, the Dallas and Guattari movement in India. He and my friend uh, George Burgess, uh, so I'm really happy to, to be here to, to listen to him. And he's also a research fellow now at the Global Institute of Technology in the Humanities in, uh, in Seoul, Gyeonggyu University in Seoul. And uh, his presentation today is called uh, Objects as Events, uh, Two of the Theory of Multiplicity. So again, 30 and 10, Manoj, if that's all right. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. I hope the others yeah. can too. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Shomu Brother Chaudhary, for this generous introduction. And I'm really honored for you to, uh, for having you as my chair. And of course, uh, who otherwise affectionately was called Shomu, right? Like it is kind of a, uh, a name which resonates mostly in our conversation, mostly in my conversation with George all the time. So it's always there on the plane of uh, the virtual plane, like sometimes actualizing. Uh, thanks for the invitation, Professor uh, Simi Malhotra, Professor Nishad Saidi, Sara, and um, and 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 Shredda, who were in touch with me for other other formalities and all. And thanks, Professor Sogda Baudri, for for being here for my presentation. Yeah, so this is, uh, I have given the title as objects as events towards the theory of multiplicity. I've just changed a little bit of it on the title, objects as multiplicities towards a post-human anthropology. But I would say a post-post-human anthropology, right? Okay, so I'll start my presentation. <laughs> and this presentation is on, like I'm, I don't go into any of my empirical research, uh, which, which kind of inform me give me the data to sort of like, you know, think and reflect on, which was uh, my research was on alcohol as, a, as an object uh, in Kerala, that was my PhD. And then after that, like mostly I was doing uh, my teaching at Jamia, uh, which where my focus was on digital objects. So basically it, it kind of helped me come up with a theory of objects in, in, term, in, in terms of philosophy. So what is it to posit a problem of construing an object in the epistemic waters of anthropology and philosophy is the first question that has to be addressed. It is not that the nature of the object has changed, but the new objects, genes, atoms, bytes have radically reconfigured the ontology of human and the epistemic structure of the disciplines. The new science have dismembered the human body into organs, fluids, and codes. We have reached a stage in which perhaps a new body can be reassembled from an organ bank of body fluids and genetic software or wetware. The biogenetic, neural and mediatic information becomes a new capital which informs the process of life mining. 
The cognitive capitalism employs different methods to monitor the capacities of biomediated bodies like DNA testing, brain fingerprinting, neural imaging, body, body heat detection, iris hand recognition, which all could be used as a surveillance techniques as well. The Human Genome Project is at pains to unify the whole of humanity under the master sign of the gene, creating a new pan-humanity itself. But the genetic unification extends to the animal world too, thereby creating an interspecies web that enfolds all living matter in the universe. The informational power of the living matter becomes the target of this new mode of capitalism, which sees life as surplus, which employs a different demography from that of Foucauldian biopolitics. The sexual, racial, and natural difference, which were the boundary markers of a classical humanism, have disappeared into a miasma of a post-human marked by disjunctive synthesis and a transversal subjectivity. The autopoietic nature is not confined to the human species alone, but to all life forms driven by informational codes, which interacts in multiple ways with the social, psychic, and ecological environment. This complex field of data flows and information resulted in the post-human relational subjectivity. This relationality proposed by the post-human subject transgresses the boundaries of species and questions the anthropocentric definition of life. It was in the modern episteme, according to the order of knowledge laid out by Foucault in the order of things, that, he repre that the representational taxonomic table of classical natural history was replaced by the notion of life, which marked the birth of modern biology. Thus the movement was from the representational structure in terms of identities, identities and difference to the interiority of life. Thus life becomes the object of biological inquiry. According to Helmrich, the object of biological inquiry has become the material component of living things, which are rearranged and dispersed and frozen, amplified and exchanged within an exposed laboratory. The genomic reshuffling of biomatter and the digital representation and simulation of life in terms of biocomputing and bioinformatics, destabilize the ontological foundation of life provided by life forms. In his ethnographic work amongst the biologists, on the ground that they were engaged in the process of identifying the vitalis edge and those who construe the biological theories. This uh, Helmerich identifies three new domains. One is that of artificial life, where the, technical, where the technological simulation of life or digital life form happens. Second one is the marine biology, studying microbes in extreme ecologies of temperature, chemistry, and pressure, pushing the limits. And the third one is that of astrobiologists, discerning and defining biosignatures of extraterrestrial life in extra extraterrestrial objects. This is, thus the three disciplines, artificial life, extreme marine, mi marine microbiology, and astrobiology deals with the limits of organic, earthly, and cosmic life. Everything organic and non-organic, and the human and the non-human, all become unified under the logic of life. Here the object takes a different turn and the logic of life studies becomes a key to understand the non-human objects as well, which is well explained by the new school of new materialism and life studies. This is in fact a revival of animism in anthropology, which is represented by Taylor and Whiteley School in philosophy, Bergson, uh, and these, these two intersecting each other. There is another anthropologist, famous anthropologist, Timin Gold, who also talks about life forms. He quotes Paul Klee in his observation, and I quote, form giving is movement, action, form giving is life. He urges us not to focus on the replicated finished form, but to participate with the forces that bring form into being. In Gold posits the formation, the process, against the product, and flows and transformation against the state of matter. Form is death, form giving is life. Brings, which he also brings in an opposition between things and objects. And he defines life as the generative capacity of the field of relations from where the form arises. Any emphasis on material agency is the result of falling out from life, from things to objects. The focus on life process will inevitably divert the attention from the materiality to fluxes and flows of materials which will map the paths of form generation. Movement along these paths of form generation are creative as he, as he thinks that it is an improvised, improvisation joining with the form generation than looking back from the finished product. 
these pathways are not characterized by connections or relations but lines along which things continually coming into being and he hints at the entanglement of things and meshwork meshwork of meshwork of interwoven lines of growth and development but not network In this paper, what I'm trying to delineate is the philosophical and anthropological context in which the placement of subject happened from the epistemic order. Uh, epistemic order, as far as the human science are concerned, as articulated by Foucault in his Magnus, magnum opus, The Order of Things, and another pertinent tract in anthropology on the importance of objects, non-humans in life as postulated by Latour, and finally the explication of the philosophical system postulated by Deleuze and Guthari, which made possible the transversal, transversal connections that underlie the epistemic configuration of a non-anthropocentric anthropology. For session, uh, I have time till what time? It's 11.58 right now. Like twelve twenty is the time. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, so uh, maybe Manoj. Manoj uh, uh, yeah, please. because ten minutes is for question answers. So, so you have twelve more. Twelve minutes. Twelve minutes more. Yeah. Ten minutes more. Twelve. Twelve. Till eleven. Till twelve ten, and okay. then ten minutes we'll keep for question answer because we would like to hear what okay, uh, will... Shama Bada sir also has to say. Okay, I will skip. Uh, mm -hmm. I will skip. So sorry. So sorry. Skip Foucault then. It's okay. The conceptual similarity between the theoretical structure of Deleuze and Bruno Latour can be identified in the virtual possibilities of a transversal thinking, which is primarily non human centric. But it should be noted that while combining these two theoretical structures, there are, these are two distinctive philosophical systems, and not to mention the theoretical complexity of Deleuzean philosophical system. Latour's contribution to the non-human centered paradigm in terms of the object-oriented anthropology that he puts, puts forward. But this is not just a mere adaptation of the metaphor of network, but he has got philosophical, he has got deep philosophical inquiries embedded in it. The metaphysical structure of Latour is Leibnizian primarily, though he is influenced by an array of philosophers like Spinoza, Whitehead, Serres, and sociologists like Gabriel Tade. These influences are quite indicative of his domain his domain where, which he, in which he engages with anthropology and philosophy, especially in his postulation of the philosophy of objects, which has a subsequent impact on the nature-culture divide in anthropology. The philosophical exegesis of objects, which questions the centrality of human subject, is based on three important concepts, actants, networks, and translation. Serra's con concept of quasi-object is quite central in Lathurian framework of actual and network theory. Okay, I, I'm not giving the example. There are different examples that he gives, like uh, for uh, for the example of uh, the speed bump, an example of ball, and all those things. I'm just I'm just I'm just skipping because I have to somehow reach the loose. It's a so when, an ob so when an object becomes an actor in Lathurian actor network theory, and how does it function? In that network, the central actant creates a field of action around it and influence the other accent actants in the network. So the will of the other actants will be translated in accordance with the interest of a central actor. Then the central actor can be called an actant. The actants are ob objects in action, and in actant object, an actant object is not relevant in the Lathurian if it is not in action, it is not relevant in the Latourian framework. So in short, in, act in actant network theory, there is an actant that creates a field of action around it. In the network, it influences the other actants and translates other actants will in their vocabulary and influence other actants into their specific, into their specific action. This is how an actant comes into being. There is no guarantee that the network remains the same and the central actant remains in the same position. The network can completely reconfigure when other actor becomes the central actor and undergoes the process of translation. It can be exemplified through an another example. During the takeoff of the flight, it can be considered a network in which the flight attendants, flight attendants, pilots, travelers, technicians, or all actants. Suddenly this network can be reassembled if there happens to be a bird in the field of the flight. 
it becomes a central actor in the reassemble network. So thus anything can become the actant, whether it be virus or the bird. The actor becomes part of the actor network through the process of translation. There are three stages in the process of, trans sorry, four stages in the stages in the process of translation. One is problematization. Second one is interestment. Third one is enrollment. And fourth one is mobilization. In the first phase, the central actor defines the problem in favor of their interest and, that, and locates the responsibilities of other actors in such a way to make the central actor an obligatory passage point in the network. In the process of interestment, the actant attempts to impose and stabilize the identity of other actors the way it defines through its problematization. The phase of enrollment entails multilateral negotiations, trials of strength, and tricks that accompany the investments which enable them to succeed. This is in fact used to explain how scientific theory comes into existence. It is partially an answer to what happens in the process of inscribing the laboratory experiments. There will be a central actor and, and network will be formed by complying to the interest of the central actor by accommodating other experiments and its inference while neglecting the ones which don't comply, or else it will be subjected to the process of interestment. All the independent actors have their interest, and once the network comes into being, the interest of other actors will be inculcated into the interest of the central actor. Here, relationality with other actors and other phenomena become the key factor in actor network theory. This is applicable to all the objects. For example, alcohol can also be located only in the network of interrelations. Discerning the relations of networks or networks of networks will unravel a new reality regarding the objects. To give an another example from Latour, the changes that happened with the room keys in the hotel room, despite the request made by the host, host, hostel, sorry, host, hotel authorities, people were not willing to return the keys while they go out. While the hotel authorities are bound to provide, bound to provide the renders the key, they in fact run the risk of keys getting lost while the tourists go out without submitting go out without submitting it back or if the guests don't return it back. The problem was resolved by adding weight, little more weight to the key, which becomes uncomfortable for the tourists to carry it along. And it was a material strategy to resolve the issue. But still they, risk, still they run the risk of getting the key lost. That was resolved when the key was replaced by a coded card. And one can identify the network of relations and problems of trust and risk unravel when you look at the network of key tourists and the hot, and the host, hotel administrators. I, I'm, I'm jumping into the Delusian session. So as you've already seen how Foucault has raised the problems, this is, we haven't seen, but it is there in the paper. So raised the problem of a dissolution of man as an epistemic category and the flat ontology proposed by Bruno Latour with his proposal of actants which can be anything from raindrops to banks to microbes to humans to disposes. But the theoretical structure of Latour is not comprehensive as its explanatory structure is limited to objects in action. The pre-individual aspects of the object or the process of individuation is missing in the theoretical structure of Latour. If with Apadure, things becomes relevant only when it enters into the hood of the commodity as it creates value. In Latour, the object becomes only relevant when it is in action, which means them, which means for them being part of a network. In a delusion, theoretical structure is more complicated as an inert object is fraught with an intensive field of virtual possibilities and it becomes embedded in a stream of time. In Delos, there is no subject or object position, but all are multiplicities. As Bergson clarifies, the question of one and many is a false choice, which is to be warded off in favor for multiplicities. The concept of multiplicity weights the question of a presupposed unity, a self-contained subject, or a totality. Rather, subjectivations, totalizations, and unifications are in fact processes which are produced and appear in multiplicities. Thus, it eliminates the question of essence and privileges the concept of university of being, which makes the differentiation of multiplicities possible without falling into the trap of equivocal relations. As we go by the division of Michel de Bestigui, 
Delusian conception of multiplicity falls into two stages. The first stage of ontogenesis developed in the initial work of Delos mainly and in his magnum opus Difference and Repetition. And the second stage of Becoming X, which is explicated in his later works, especially in the Capitalism and Species Brain of Williams. Though the disdivision is here, sorry, it is Manuel Delanda who argued that multiplicity is one of the central concepts which runs consistently through the works of Delos, but attains variations and different synonyms like idea, problem, object X, rhizome, hexity, etc. The traditional philosophy steeped in the structure of recognition and representation, articulated mainly by the philosophy of Descartes and Kant, is being criticized by Deleuze for the same reason. The famous proposition of I think, therefore I am, proposes thinking as an epistemic process and at the same time as an ontological state. Here, thinking is con considered as a concordia facultatum, as all, the as all the faculties are brought together in an agreeable synthesis to focus on the object. This recognition through the synthesis of various faculties, which becomes a unity of the subject and the identity of the object as well. In this synthesis, the cogito becomes a transcendental figure in which all other faculties of their activities and their activities are being curtailed, are being crucified. This constitutes a world of representation and identity wherein the differences are being curtailed. What if some of the experience doesn't fall into the regime of representation and recognition, leaving one in a state of wonder or any other affective states? So what Delos would argue for is a liberation of sensation from the transcendental effects of cogitation, not being a foot servant to other higher faculties. In that sense, each faculty should be intensified to the point of dissolution to attain the unique intensity or its radical difference. This is what Deleuze refers to as transcendental empiricism, where this senses attains, senses intensity attains the transcendent level to access the empirical reality, which is not amenable to the empirical domain of the common sense. But the question is how to liberate the senses from the unificatory mechanism of thinking via amplification or dissolution <coughs> to discover its own unique intensity or radical difference. In order to avail this radical difference, we should not think real only in terms of actuality. That means extensities. It is to think in terms of it. it thinking in extensities, ex, extensities means thinking in terms of stable identities, which form the dogmatic image of thought. When you measure and compare, the sensation will be secondary. Here the, here the reality splits into the dimension of virtual and actual, the intensive and extensive multiplicity. The virtual becomes an important concept in Deleuze and is synonymous with the concept of being itself. This is being explicated in terms of a Deleuzean synthesis of time, especially in the context of Bergson, the active synthesis of time. Um, Manoj, uh, are you done? No, I've just started. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we'd love to hear from you, but we have, you know, uh, we, uh, we have a question and we would really like... Uh, the chair, Shamadutta, sir, to uh, comment uh, on your paper because we haven't really heard from him. Give me one minute. Really like... no, yes. take, take, take a couple of minutes here. Take a couple of minutes yes. here. Give, give, me, give me one minute yeah. so that like, I will tell you what no, I wanted no, to take two, what, no, I was, take what, was, what I was What I was trying to do in this paper. Basically. So basically yes, yes, what yes, I'm yes. trying to do is I'd like to go beyond what you mean by, it's like, as I said in the introduction itself, like with the emergence of life studies, especially, uh, it's like a pushing the limits of the, the pushing the limits of the, the extremes of life, so that you have to go beyond to a theoretical position, something beyond post-human. But if life becomes a central aspect, if life is something which you can identify, if you read Timin Gold closely, you can find the resonance of Simon and there. I mean, they were quoting uh, Deleuze and Guattari very straightly, but. There are so much resonance of Simondon over there. So, what do you mean by this metastability or all those all those sort of concepts will be kind of uh, interpret, interpreted as sort of an animism or an animus or object as animus or something like that. It's like a life form. That is that is something which I'm looking that I was, I was proposing. It is also something which I would like to say beyond beyond posthuman something what you call life studies, critical life studies right now. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so thank you so All much. All right, okay. Yeah, Shamadu, okay. please go ahead. 
थैंक यू थैंक यू मनोज थैंक यू थैंक यू दो यू हैव टू कर्टेल योर एंटायर आई मीन द फुल रेंज ऑफ योर प्रेजेंटेशन व्हाट यू व्हाट यू सेड वाज इटसेल्फ सो सो फुल ऑफ पॉसिबिलिटीज एंड एंड सो मेनी रियली रियली फैसिनेटिंग स्ट्रैंड्स ऑफ थिंकिंग हैव इमर्ज फ्रॉम योर प्रेजेंटेशन दैट इट इज रियली फैंटास्टिक टू हियर यू uh so again uh my 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 first, let me perform my first uh, my first uh, duty which is to ask for uh, interventions questions and towards the end maybe uh, i'll take a couple of minutes for myself thank you thank you sir uh dr manoj uh, this uh, you know professor yasmin arif has a question for you uh, she's also a plenary and she's you know asking what is the place of the social in your formulation or in another way how would you imagine the social in your work um uh, this is one question and uh, you know and another question from sakshi rogra is like you know what if object uh, and what do you think of object centric theory of emotions and affect so these two if you could quickly uh, you know respond to these two questions and then uh, the chair would you know he's all you know, he can talk uh, to uh, you and you know uh, mention his comments thank you yeah the first question the the place of social in your formulations in another way how do you imagine the social in your work you know, that is uh, uh, that is my last chapter of the book when i was like i'm rewriting my thesis like you know reassembling the social the title what letun gave something to come up with uh, uh, i have no uh, i have no idea as of now to kind of formidably come in like what will be my formulation of social in my work but definitely Uh, something um uh, yeah i i i share the share the criticism that latour raises against the 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 construction of the social and the inevitability to reassemble the social uh i can't think of an any other answer as of now because it's uh, it's not just a simple question i think like you know how do you imagine the social in your work it's a uh, sort of uh, uh, it it demands a lot of thinking there was a second there was a second yeah yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. 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 impose impersonal emotions can function like objects what would an object centric theory of emotions and affects be uh, like like objects can can impersonal emotions be an engaging uh, ground for transformation yep that is uh, something uh, what do you call affect studies i would say mm-hmm. like in the lucian paradigm like you know for um, you say uh, from the spinozian strand they are developing this affective relation that is something affect is something which makes possible the transversal connections in one way with the best example to give from deleuze is like you know the the relation between a race car and a and a race horse right rather than a, 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 like a fluff fluff horse and fluff ox will come together not in terms of even though species species wise these are different but you can combine together in terms of affects like you know it can come it can come together that's where i think this kind of transversality or something what you call like crossing the species sort of stuff uh becomes or you even go beyond something like an aristotelian division of species and genera and all those things yeah that is what i would respond to that and is there any other questions uh, no 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 dr manoj there are no more questions thank you so much for uh, and don't please don't hate me for cutting you short a couple of times uh, yeah I, um, and I, please I, I, uh, would request the chair to please all right uh, okay. know, uh, all right thank, so, you. thank you thank you very much so manoj uh, yes. uh, also the uh, the first presentation that do in some senses they were very different and their singularities were uh, remarkable and yet uh, they were both concerned with an experience that is uh, uh, absolutely central to our current historical existence um 
So uh, there are two things which occurred to me, which I'll, which I'll just mention very briefly. Uh, Manoj, the first thing, and that's something which I, I was curious about looking at the title of your presentation, mm -hmm. uh, which is that um, your presentation is about objects as events, which, which you right. very persuasively argue for through a range of thinkers. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, in, in Deleuze's uh, uh, early work, Logic of Sense particularly, uh, he uh, speaks of, uh, in his readings of the Stoic philosophers, of events as objects. It's, it goes the, the other way. Yeah. Events as abstract objects. Um, and he, he does that through particularly the acts of uh, language. So when, when, when a particular statement is made, then that statement produces what he calls an incorporeal, through reading Stoics, of course, through incorporeal events. Yeah. And the incorporeal events are objects, but they're abstract objects. They are not objects in the sense of things. They are objects already in the sense of transformations. So what we have is a counterintuitive and a really, really uh, unique proposition in Dallas, which is that transformations change as objects. Change is actually not a change between objects or a change in an object. Change itself yeah. is a singularity. It is an object. That is not an object to be merely experienced through a thing, phenomenologically, but something which is both the intensity and thought uh, articulated together. That in Deleuze was actually a revolutionary change of perspective in philosophy. Uh, and it was the really central moment in rupturing the unity of the subject, who is the center of the phenomenological uh, horizon of experience in Dallas, which is also later, of course, like you very correctly point out, uh, which is uh, then uh, spoken of through different synonyms, the impersonal, um, the, 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 the multiplicity of cause, but also uh, other kinds of uh, scientific uh, terminologies are used. Um, sometimes geological, sometimes biological. Uh, and there, a new kind of vocabulary develops, which is the vocabulary of life. And this vocabulary actually uh, traverses the range from non-organic to organic references, so that something striking happens, which is, again, a counterintuitive result, a disjunctive counterintuitive result, which is, Something like a dis, uh, something like a non-organic life, the thought of a non-organic life, which again is a thought which no subject phenomenologically can apparently grasp. So there is no meaning there in the ordinary phenomenological sense uh, as a horizon, but something else that is going on, which there is again. So there's a in there is there is an immanence of not just as a concept, but in the very process of thinking. That is the greatness of Dallas. That in the very process of thinking something new, he makes that process new. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is the immanence of the act of thinking itself. Uh, so my question then, and it's a general question, uh, is that how does that pertain to our current experience when we are experiencing life mm, in the sense of something which is a concept, but which is also something which is immediately related to uh, it's crisis, it's immunitarian crisis. It's crisis of something which apparently is both living like the virus, and yet it itself becomes something which is, uh, which produces a kind of fragility, kind of exposure in uh, forms of species life, organic life. Uh, something which traverses one species to the other, from the bat to the humans and so on and so forth. And yet the virus itself is organic. The virus is not really a non-organic form of life. So is there, in the current experience, a certain, a certain pressure of phenomenology, the very phenomenological pressure of living a life which is exposed to something like the danger of another form of life, uh, uh, the virus, uh, which, uh, though you're right, the virus can be just like any other form of life, objective, uh, organic or non-organic, like in the Latour kind of actant sense. Yeah. But uh, the meaning that we are, we, are, we, are in a, we are under pressure to give it, which is both extremely organic, it has to be organic, it is vital, it is a force of life and death. But at the same time, 
its knowledge is something that we lack in terms of immunity, in terms of our own species centricity, which is human life, protection of human life. The moment you do that, you have also already gone back to the older privilege of the subject, no? We are saying the human subject as thinking about human life must be protected. And once you do that, you are not in the realm of life, but you are in the realm of state. Your realm. So immunity is a word which moves from life to the state, life to policy, life to governmentality. Yeah. So that is a very interesting displacement, it seems to me, which is a kind of uh, the pressure of our crisis is producing an intense conservatism, not just in the overall you know, situation of discourse, but in a particular situation of scientific discourse, of philosophical discourse. In that sense, a kind of retreat from a thinker like Dallas. Yeah, shall I respond to that? Yeah, that's that. That's my that's my comment. So please, yeah. if you want. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I got your question. It was quite an elaborate one, and I got something from your comments as well. So thanks for that. But what if I I would uh, ask you another question? You are talking about the, this uh, microbe, uh, which is right now playing out its uh, role, or like you know, I would say I would ask you like, in terms of like what do you call of other than your exteriority, what about your interiority? There are certain, like, I think, n number of microorganisms inside your body. It's in another cosmos, right? If one dies, if one dies, you will get a loose motion, like, you know? So it's, you are not, it, this is not first an encounter with a microbe outside or something. You yourself is carrying those things inside, in your, in your, in your universe itself, right, you know, in, inside your body. Like, I don't exactly remember the number of it. It is 10 raised to something, like sort of mi microorganisms inside your body, right? So that is where I think that the, the, the self that you are talking about, the exterior relations and the interior relations, only a threshold, like sort of in betweenness. So I, I, I do think that like, you know, this is, because uh, Deleuze already talked about this virus and it's quite strange to kind of, like we didn't notice the virus, it's, it's virulence this, this in, in this effective manner before, but it was mentioned in Thousand Plato's and, and other things. But my, my, challenge, my question would be this, like if you are asking about like this object coming from outside, what about the object, what about the microbe living forms inside your body, you carrying it. And it's a symbiotic relation also, sort of. Yes, yes, Manoj. I mean, this is, we don't have the time for a elaborate discussion, but that is exactly my point, that there is already something which in the order of thought goes far beyond the question of the virus as merely an external danger coming from the outside, because that's not true. You're right. It's only a threshold. There are, there are, there are millions of bacteria that swim within us, that we are constituted out of. Absolutely correct. What I'm saying is the pressure of our crisis, our historical crisis is producing a certain intellectual retreat, a kind of retreat from the radicality of Dallas thinking or a thinker like or whoever else, which has actually taken us far beyond philosophically this understanding. But there is a certain retreat under the political, the historical pressure of not being able to deal with this specific empirical crisis. That is exactly my point. I agree with you. So it is like what psychoanalysis would call a symptom, not a symptom of nature, but a symptom of history. That somewhere historically we are not able to deal with something that we already, in terms of knowledge, in terms of our conceptual thinking, have gone far beyond with, the great, with thinkers like Deleuze and other thinkers. That is exactly my point. So I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. So it's like a symptom. Anyway, so the, this is a discussion that, that can carry on uh, for, uh, you know, and uh, we'll carry on in different forums. So thank you. Thank you so much, um, Manoj, uh, Geoff Bradley, for your presentations today. And uh, to Jamia Milia and all of you for having uh, so kindly invited me to chair this session. I'm very grateful to all of you. And I hope you have a wonderful next few days of, uh, yeah, of uh, presentations and discussions. So thank you again.
Thank you so much, Omuda. Really, really grateful to you. I, you know, I mean, we wanted to sacrifice the break and actually listen to you a little bit more on, on Joff's paper. If you have three or four minutes or if you want to speak on no, that. No, I don't mind. I don't mind, but I don't want you to sacrifice your break. It's no, no, but we want to. We want to. It's rare to get you like this, Shomuda. So maybe just three or four minutes if you could, if you would like to, because Joff is also yeah. here. So we didn't course, get a chance yeah. to No, speak no, of course. My pleasure entirely. My pleasure entirely. Uh, so, so, so thank you. Yes, uh, yes, uh, Prof, uh, Joff, Joff. So let me call you Joff, if you don't mind. Uh, so, uh, so uh, yes, Joff, uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, your, your um, if you can hear me, your discussion hear you. of these, these three metaphors, um, you know, and I myself have been partly uh, engaged with, with thinking about these things. So what, what I was saying was, what occurred to me was, uh, that, you know, everything seems to be eventually grounded on the, um, uh, on the language of image or imagery of war. Uh, and it's something that is so common, surrounds us all the time, that we are fighting a war against the virus. Again, it goes back to the point I was making with Manoj, that, like you said very correctly, that this is an image of a very traditional image of something from outside, which attacks us and we defend ourselves. Uh, but even at that level, my question is, oh my, it's not a question to you, but it's a question that we all discussed today. Uh, are there natural wars? Can there be a natural war? Because in, if there is a meaning of war in the sense of the real, uh, then war is something which, in which there is a kind of decision, like you know, Carl Schmitt, the political theologian said, um, there's a decision. And in that sense, in war, there is a kind of peculiar egalitarianism where both parties are historically constituted as enemies. And in that sense, they agree to play that part in a particular historical conjuncture. But that surely does not hold for a natural entity or a biological entity, like, for instance, you know, the human body and the virus. There's something there which is in the in the in the in the in the order of intensity, sure, uh, in the order of something which is involuntary um, processes of so the so language, of course, beyond a point, really um, saturates itself. So we, I myself refer to the as, assault of the virus, attack of the virus. We do that all the time. Nevertheless, the threshold of thinking, which produces concepts, and in this case, the concept of war. Uh, does it, does it hold up? Is it consistent? That is something I've been curious about throughout this period, when there is such an overwhelming presence of the word war. Um, so when, when we speak of wound and the front line and uh, each of these things, and the, the ground of war seems to be present in, in nearly everything. Uh, so I was curious about whether you, um, how you would think about the larger image of war. So yes, that is that is one point. And the other point is, of course, uh, uh, I, I totally agree with you that this transcendence of the portal is something which is, uh, which is very linear. And it, it is it is a kind of, it is a kind of passage without uh, any displacement. Uh, there is, it seems a kind of an image of continuity through which a, a sort of unconscious immaculate or transformation takes place, uh, in which case uh, uh, the virus becomes like an unconscious tool of history to produce through which we sort of, to, 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 whose force leads us to pass from through the portal. I do not uh, subscribe to that, mm, that proposition. Unconscious, uh, I don't think um, the virus is an unconscious tool of history. And that, that idea of the Hegelian idea of unconscious tool of history itself is already historical. You see, the unconscious is also historical. The unconscious is not natural. Nature is already already a signifier of history. Uh, so, in 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 that sense, my my, my other question related question is always uh, of of how to think historically in our times, because it seems to me that all our symptoms are historical, and yet uh, we want to continuously sort of mm, renaturalize them because common sense tells us that. Uh, what is happening to us is natural. That's why we use the word event, uh, as if the event is like an earthquake, like 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 a, like a, a natural calamity. But at the same time, to give it its due seriousness, we use the word war. 
But wars are historical. So we see, again, there's an undecidability in our relationship to the present crisis in terms of nature and history. Those are the two things that I wanted to uh, mention. Just two, huh? Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot going on there. Well, I, I'm, I'm, there's, there's absolutely no way I can kind of get through that. But, you know, you mentioned kind of war as being natural. Mm. Now, the way I got into Telad de Chardin, this, this thinker, is through, I'm researching about the concept of the new sphere, uh, which is, um, you find this in uh, Telad de Chardin and Vladimir Vernadsky, and um, uh, Edward uh, Loire, uh, writing in the 1920s, but this idea of what the new sphere is. Now, in Terra de Chardin, as you may well know, that this the description of the new sphere, nous means mind. So this would be something which kind of envelops the earth, okay, like a higher state of consciousness. And in this, his logic, human consciousness, historical consciousness, right, is developing or progressing or moving forward to a state where he calls it the omega point kind of uh, perfection which would be a kind of unification with god now i think that sounds very hegelian this kind of movement of towards absolute knowledge so that's why i kind of trying to touch on on um on the kind of wound in in hegel's thought so but that's telad de chardin now vernadsky uh the the russian uh, scientist Mm. He has a thing about thinking the living matter, consciousness, if you like, as a, a natural uh, a part of the biosphere. So out of the biosphere, this is um, organic matter and inorgan ma inorga inorganic matter blended together. Out of that is something happen something happens in geologic time, which is human consciousness which emerges out of that now i i kind of um i'm become became a student of this kind of thinking uh, recently so that for me like a consciousness uh, is part of nature because it's part of the biosphere according to to those two quite different logics of Tela de chardin the jesuit uh, priest and vernadsky the, the russian uh, scientist so that would seem to me to think about war and peace. Now, Telad de Chardin is a, a thinker of peace, even though he experiences the, the trauma of war in the First World War. And he finds in that moment of war the possibility of a new kind of peace. So that would that that would be a phenomenological explanation. I don't I don't have to touch upon uh, Deleuze at all there. That would be where we can think about phenomenologically a uh, description of the present, of the moment, and, and, and think about how, how peace would emerge out of that kind of that battlefield, that warlike state. So I am in, I think I am kind of, I'm actually kind of rejecting a lot of Deleuze at the moment and going back to Hegel, because I think that, that some way might help me to think about the kind of Mm, the return of the human, maybe to problematize the idea of of nature itself and how consciousness is part of nature, and and then to think about how one would somehow come out of a warlike state into a higher state of consciousness. So I kind of I mean between those two thinkers at the moment, Vernadsky and yeah. Taylor de Chardin. So I kind of yeah, it's a very productive kind of question you asked me and um I, I would probably need another year to answer it <laughs> and i hope i hope that year dissolves the question itself <laughs> Don't it. yeah yeah so well, no no, no, no yes absolutely I, I i recognize uh the direction that you take and i i really find it very interesting and um i i i just think that uh just this last point that while I completely agree with you, and that's what I was also, you know, saying after Manoj's presentation, that in a way, whether it's Delos or, you know, before Delos, the Lada Shada, and other thinkers, we have already, uh, we've already had enormously sophisticated theories the early, from early 20th century, you're right, where this, uh, this very, very static binary distinction between nature and consciousness 
yeah. uh, human, human, human and non-human yeah. has been broken down yeah. 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 irreversibly on the one hand. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, you see, that's the point. The contingency of a historical experience uh, actually produces conservative movements in knowledge, uh, intellectual conservatism, uh, mm -hmm. and which itself is articulated with deep political uh, reaction, uh, which we are seeing today. Uh, so in a way, the efforts that uh, people are making, including yours, are admirable in the face of this dominant retreat. Um, absolutely. At the same time, that retreat itself needs to be understood in, uh, well, sort of psychoanalytic terms as what I'm calling symptom, mm. uh, as a symptom, not at all as the truth, but as a symptom. And that symptom is because there is a crisis of the signifier. We do not know mm. what what to do with the real, mm. such that there's an undecidability between the real and metaphor. Uh, that's all I'm saying. And that is also saying a lot. So, mm. Mm. Thank you. yeah, that's, that's it. yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Swamiya, sir. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Job, for uh, pitching in again. And uh, so, so sorry for the shortage of time. We Not know that course, this is a sir. long discussion yeah. and uh, very enriching to listen to both of you as well. Uh, we'll quickly move on to the uh, paper sessions uh, and I'll hand over the uh, mic to my co rapporteurs uh, Grace. Um, would you please uh, introduce the next chair and take care of the next presentations? So I'll have to excuse myself for, for yes, the next Yes, question. yes. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining in this session. And uh, we have paper, four paper presentations coming up in the next session. And the chair for that session is, uh, yeah, Dr. Manoj. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the third session of the day. And in this session, we have four paper presentations like an upset and the session would be chaired by um, Dr. Manoj and Vai, whom we have just heard in our plenary. Uh, Dr. Manoj and Vai is currently research fellow at Global Center for Technology and Humanities, Yung he, uh, University, Seoul. He's also the journal secretary of Deleuze and Guattari Studies in India Collective, which has already organized four international conferences on Deleuze and Guattari in India. And he was the convener of the World Congress on Deleuze and Guattari, which was also held in Delhi. He very recently organized an online lecture series on pandemic and the imminence of life hosted by the Center for Culture, Media and Governance, Jamia Media Islamia, formerly a fellow at Centro in Country, Umani Escona, Switzerland. Currently, he's associated with an international research project on critical post-media studies in Asia in collaboration with TQ University, Japan and Yung He University, South Korea. He's currently editing a book titled Deleuze, Qatari and India, Transdisciplinary Vectors and Interconnections with Professor Ian Buchanan and Dr. George Verghese Kate to be published by Rutledge. Welcome, sir. We are delighted to have you here. And the platform is all yours now. Thank you so much, uh, Ruchi Nakpa, for the introduction. Uh, without wasting your time, I think I should call upon the first speaker, who is Aish Bishwas, who is a graduate student at the Department of International Relations, Jadopur University. And his presentation is titled, oh, Through After Hours, Speciality and post this Unbecoming. May I invite uh, uh, Aish Bishwas? Good morning to everyone. Good afternoon to everyone present here. So I'll be starting my presentation in a few seconds. Give me some time. I will just share the screen. Yeah, right. Is it visible? Yes, Ayush, it is visible. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I think uh, most of the paper, like the paper encircles a form of mapping throughout um, Weekend's work in the last 10 years and his discography. So I'll be starting this session. The last few decades of philosophical thought has been oriented towards asking the question, that is, what do we understand about the human condition? We can reduce this question into, two double, uh, into a double articulation. The first one, 
the condition that the human is being subjected to and secondly then the second sentence is the technologies of subjugation producing these conditions we are used to the li liberal academic architecture behind the forming of the subject which prior prioritizes the agency of unhinged freedom promised by instrumentality of democratic institution the instrumentality is instrumentality is coded through technologies of late capitalism and projected into a possibility any such construction of a possibility is always located towards a becoming however this become is becoming is teleological because it poses the possibility in a duration like if you are uh, like in the first seminars of uh, delios at the university party he distinguish between two um, in you know, the understanding of bergson's understanding of time into duration that is a qualitative qualitative multiplicity and uh, uh, time as a quantitative multiplicity multiplicity so what we are doing here is to try to reduce the whole uh, over of um, of weekend's discography into a duration that is a limited structure limited structure in a sense where uh, how delius would call it a movement from pole a to pole b at the molar stage so any such construction of what i call a possibility is always located towards a becoming a becoming which is limited towards the this given pole b however this become is becoming is teleological wait let me move so this like i i reference benjamin's work on in the in your history benjamin sees the technology of the technologies as modes of each regime of history from the earlier archaeological orientation to the genealogy to the genealogical discourse in focus earlier works and the later seminars we see an analysis of the construction of this conditioned subject and the given dis disciplinary institutions that produced these given technologies of condition in the larger macro academic space in post structural thought and later in the works of delius we see a critique of the liberal notions of understanding the democratic human subject the liberalism through uh, the liberalism through its discourse on democratic techno technologies and modes has conceptualized a meta narrative of human who is free because of its own subjectivity when we enter the post 40 setting just after 1970s when we see new forms of public administration administrating administrative systems like npms and nps coming in we see that we see that the democratic model that made us misrecognize the subject the subjects subjugation being uh, and uh, so okay so when we enter this post 40 setting this democratic model that made us misrecognize the subject subjugation Helped in creating, decentering, and along with it, sublimating the modes through which we interpreted the technologies of deciding. In the late, in the later part of the essay, I'll, uh, I tried to highlight how I use how I started using Spivak's methodology of understanding rep representation and misrecognition. That is the understanding of Bethriten and Rastin, which translates to proxy and portrait. So what we do is that. we take our subject that is uh, our subject that is our rnb that is the R, that is the rnb project of evil tesway that is the weekend as a form of mapping what are we what we are tracing here is the appropriation of simile codes of uh, simile codes that the system of the late that the systems of late stage capitalism turns and mutates into micro micro segment segmentary flows in segmentary flows and copies the system to form a immaterial immaterial reduced but similar look alike over the molar sphere under which it moves the subject and also helps in subjugating subject by himself throughout the 18th and 19th century regimes the, the forms of discipline has always been molar in a sense they have like if if we go back to zx zx understanding how film works we films work a film tells you how to desire it doesn't tell you what to desire but the state in the 1890s 1890 century regimes what they did was they told you the systems of they told you how the systems of designing are working and how you confess to the system so that it can interpolate into you what to design how to design ebers project to become himself possesses a potential in his project for a project to exist there needs to be a potentiality a molar becoming that makes itself opaquely appear by partaking in discursive practices Hans and uh, like uh, now I refer to Byung Chul Han. Byung Chul Han 
what he does is take this takes its understanding of interpolation as a mechanism of auto exploration under which we partake in our own regression but re misrecognize it as a system of achievement at the molar stage to uh, at the molar stage to understand this uh, misrecognition we see uh, we always posit ourselves to uh, to see uh, we always posit ourselves as a theological theological end and however since the logic of late capitalism is appropriated to micro segmentary intensifications of power it can never appropriate the whole of it when the potentiality is being mediated into the subject through the molar movements within the actual and virtual this molar becoming is always flowing along the plane of organization that is in at the molar level and always at a micro segmentary which is uh, which is comprised of uh, which is comprised of uh, what we call hexathes uh, lines of light and perceive an 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 imperceptible imperceptible flows so let's start with his like earlier works i think like this signal like i didn't if i didn't even try to censor it because if i if i did try to censor his work i would always mistake misrecognize his flows like if you see like he talks about a lot of like there's a lot of signification of drug abuse and uh, he's talking about a lot of signification of drug abuse and his dream of this california mission a mission that he needs to uh, accomplish that that is what he poses as poses as his geological end it is a it is a molar commodification commodification of oneself by constituting several multiples what are these multiples multiples are this these what i this is what i call tropes, tropes of consumption overcoating subject with potentiality only possible through this mediating consumptions the state cannot be seen here as an independent dictating panopticon anymore it is an instrument absorbed by late capitalism's tendency to mutate and structure the subject the state may not use the political panop political le political legal panopticon to dictate us to dictate us what to desire but it decentralizes its process by codifying and fragmenting it into semiotic and symbolic chain within which we are born into the birth which is stripped of of its organic humanism this new bureaucratic decentralization and machinic formation is what <clears throat> is what the weekend is a product of let's um, let's work let's look into the early aesthetic uh, shouting of his given project if like uh, if we refer to the given slide the whole uh, his first into the his first introduction into uh, into do into the field of r and b the his his new new is anti genre of r and b trying to fight against the given structures of r and b that were always already there was shrouded in a veil of un, of of something that is unknown it, his first um, album was released as from a very cryptic cryptically labeled youtube handle with just this as an album art and a voice playing behind it and his second work Wait, and his and that this, these are the artworks. These were the artworks that were first uh, published uh, that that first came up in the YouTube channels. The first songs were like "What Union We Can We Can uh, Games." Like there is no recognition of what the man is, what kind of what kind of person he is. He's just introducing himself through an opaque image of what is of what we know as an unknown. The Californian dream that the weekend is after is what we sh should uh, that what is what we should see in a multiplicity. a multiplicity which produces two molar movements one is of a being and one is the, one is of a becoming often in theory we see the opposition reproduced through the question of being versus becoming the becoming here is what i call non localizable it functions through flows and intensities along the planes of, uh, along the uh, plane of organization we situate uh, we situate the being at a molar level localized at a given point in these flows the becoming here also lies in what delius uh, to his reading of, of works and calls a multiplicity of multiplicity the molar becoming lies in a telos which is durational while at the mole at mole molecular level there is another becoming which flows towards two in intensities but which is which cannot be teleo teleologically misrecognized okay yes um and let's go the tendency of late capitalism um late capitalism desire to acquire force from the flows 
in the molecular consolidate these codes to reproduce desire which is machinic and along with it form a circuit implementing itself in the actual actual and virtualizing it like i'm uh, now i'm quoting uh, nickland's work on uh, understanding machining with desire what what nickland is talking about a system at the molar which is constituting between the actual and virtual to produce a uh, techno capitalism understand uh, techno capitalism subject of uh, implementing itself uh, through various subjects the trope of sex drugs and la dream remains a optimizing assembly driving to its potentiality within this these given circuits okay so if we go back to his uh, uh writings in writings uh, yeah the, in the, he's writing uh, songs like prisoner and what and kelly of friends which were part of his uh, coming out album beauty behind the madness he was again he talks now he talks he starts talking about the walls of this californian dream once the walls in the play is placed in this kind of californian dream we can make a posteriori deduction that the bio, that the body without organs has left the zero mark and has been situated at the molar so what is my understanding of the body without organs the body without organs cannot be cannot be easily reduced to a similar or a metaphorical for the, uh, from the plane of cons consistency and the body without organs here functions as what as a reification to produce our subject here reification of swivax reading through bang chul han becomes necessary she, because she made an important point to to make a distinction by using the words vetrin and dasen which she calls representation and representation as portrait and to represent oneself through various spheres as proxy however we will take her articulation a bit out of context yes she is right when she claims the person speaks and acts always in a multiplicity and however when reading this phenomenon however we are trying to read this phenomenon the space of any affect to represent itself is always in a double the double does not imply uh, does not simply mean that we see here are uh, that we see ourselves as a homogeneous distinct modes existing together separately what we are, are trying to posit ourselves in is a is as uh, in as a possibility as a virtualized being that is that we are going to achieve in ourselves as a uh, becoming that we never can localize at our being but can only be achieved through a molar becoming The, what the body what the organs does is that it drives this becoming once it has been appropriated by the by techno by techno capitalisms uh, techno capitalisms appropriation of the similar close codes that it appropriates from the close of intensities he our subject dreams of becoming himself but this self is codified into him as a representation of himself what he is becoming is through fragmentation of this of this proxy to the social unconscious into the subjects in, to the social unconscious into an unconscious that is very that is very authentic to him as a possible uh, ayush ayush yeah. i'm so sorry to interrupt but we are sort of hard pressed for time so could you please wrap it up in a minute or so okay so thank you even if so what we are trying to explain is that once you move away from his work in um, beauty behind the madness and go to his work in starboy and starboy we see him achieving his californian dream he writes about becoming like uh, finally becoming and achieving his teleological self and and trying to try, and he's trying what he's trying to do is that he is he is in a conflict he is writing about about suspend suspending his his organs he's trying to say he's writing about his critique of his own organs he's trying to he's trying to redeem himself of his own assemblages what are these redemptions his redemptions are seen in his uh, again in his writings in prisoner he's talking about how his prison he's a prisoner to his own addictions he's he's constituted by his own assemblages he's being blocked by his own assemblages and he cannot reproduce himself anymore because any form of reproduction is not of himself but of a but of a but of uh what of a teleological constraint becoming when he finally walks into his uh, works in after hours what what we see is that he 
doesn't he cannot bifurcate between what is organic and what is non organic he sees he he is a person who used to see his work as through an organic his dream as an organic sculpture of 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 himself but then there is this suspension a suspension that we cannot partake in this this brings us to our larger argument of the paper this unbecoming is uh, an this unbecoming in humanism in humanism always reflects a regression of molar orders of morality and ethics this regression can only be noted when one makes a human subject an object of empirical study the encounter with one which one subject which one subjects to only to a subjugation necessarily cannot and should not be conflated with seeing oneself as an object of empirical analysis on the other hand going with the likes of inhuman uh, of academic academia behind inhumanism the likes of rebrasier and nizar agastani who talks about deploying of movements of inhumanism of inhumanism to revitalize a new human drive towards the theological tendency of essentializing the human against the forces of what they call anti humanism this is what we, we need to understand and suspend first of all a subject is not encompassed by its humanness as defined by the enlightenment project's tendency we should and recourse in humanisms in humanisms project towards an effectual towards effectual encounters and possibilities which break away from any exteriorization of categorical conserv conserving a form of schizoanalytic escape these escapes then make both epistemological and ontological categories uh, not categorical but categories but rather post procedural discourses making uh, making an unbecoming this uh, and making an unbecoming the categorical the categorical the categorical conservation unnecessary i think that's it okay thank you so much thank you so much ayush we have uh, two questions for you in the chat box uh so the first question is from Sam samir ibrahim and he asks in what way does the post kali wasteland of vegas and the mojave figure in your paper do you like to respond to that uh, ruchi there is a second part to it so read the whole whole question it's it's the same question okay okay ma'am uh vis a vis the shift uh, okay so in what way does the post kali wasteland of vegas and the mojave figure in your paper vis a vis the shift from the marginal to the pedestal to the decadent and finally the desolate and the transformation of the human therein okay so the question rather makes us makes it makes it uh, makes uh, empirical advancement of our of our subject here he talks about the movement from away from the post vegas wasteland away from his later works that he is coming out when like in his uh, given interviews he, he talks about suspending his career and getting rid of his getting rid of his works and getting and he talks about the fact that he's done with his with his writing and he won't he has finally realized the what he has become of himself so when like the post kali wasteland is an ex exemplification of what we understand as uh, the wasteland that is dystopic wasteland that is left behind by techno capitalism systems so what we see here is like uh, the interior understand the interior at work the interior always produces an interiority and it and an ex exteriority so what techno capitalism codification system does is that it takes it, it makes a simile simile quotes out of this functioning and produces a flow a flow which only inter interiorizes so once a subject who is aware uh, starts becoming aware of its own subjugation he goes into a space that cannot be codified by these semi codes that is an exteriority an exteriority is something that cannot be defined that can that can only be reduced to the poetics of post the poetics of post in the sense the idea of dystopia solar punk cyberpunk that is that has that is in itself rhizomatic and is all and rhizomatic in a sense at a molecular sense and at molar cells always a reduction so to conceive of a post dystopic uh, understanding of our subject here is partly is partially difficult and can only be seen like can only be understood 
when we map is later works if any possible later works come out to imagine is to imagine it is to again the problem of representation and represent and proxy and portrait we cannot portraitize our subject here we only can we cannot give a proxy for a subject here we will wait for him to portraitize portraitize himself and then only we can realize our subjects post dystopic uh, advances thank you thank you ayush like uh, think, thank are, you are we Sorry. good with time are we good with time or like uh, not yeah we can we can move on to our next presenter sir okay okay thank ayush it was a uh, like too much of a very heavy presentation actually i got i lost track of it in between uh, but it was a very nice presentation and a very nice attempt but this is not my area of specialization to have any expert comment on that i'm really sorry i just saw my uh, this one yeah um, thank you thank you so thanks yeah. yeah so we have our next part next presentation uh, from uh, soham atikari he's from department of english presidency university kolkata so the title is unbeatification of the collective subject a discursive exploration of the phenomena of unbeatification in bird box kudito pashan and contemporary society afflicted with covid 19 over to you soham atikari yes sir. okay let me just share my screen yeah. is it visible yes perfect come my presentation is unwitification of the collective subject a discursive exploration of the phenomenon of unwitification in bird box kudita pashan and contemporary society afflicted with covid-19 i will first give an introductory overview of what unwitification actually represents in the third scene of shakespeare's othello iago comments it is as if some planet had unwitted men unwit here essentially means to deprive of wits to make crazy Maria Hearn argues that the word was a neologism by Shakespeare, formed by a conjugation of the prefix "un" and the English word "wit." However, there have been various other instances where "unwit" had been used to mean foolishness or unreason. "Unwit" therefore denotes a state of nonsense where wit has been reversed and has decomposed into inconsequential and meaningless irrationality. Unwitification is the creationary process through which this irrational unwit comes into existence. It is a transformatory ontological framework that engenders the sublimation of nonsense. In simpler terms, we may refer to it as the unmaking of sensibility. Unwitification is not a theological, philosophical, or, uh, or ideological creatio ex nihilo, but is instead a transformatory and at times quasi-reactionary phenomenon. it transforms that on which it operates both directly and indirectly unwitification might not be born out of oblivion but may very well lead to the creation what of what plate calls not memory but oblivion the former usage of oblivion denotes an absolute nothingness the latter usage of the same word signifies an ontological reversal that gives birth to a state of no being a self obsessed alienated actuality and thus a nothingness which is not absolute or perfect the oblivion thus produced is pregnant with the deridian specters of that which was present before this ontological reversal took place this imperfect oblivion that unwitification births is synonymous to the decay of memory the act of forgetting the collective subject may be regarded as that entity which forms and supplements shared or collective experiences subsequently it is imperative that such an entity would also possess some sort of collective consciousness one of the theories that effectively render and justify the issues pertaining to collective consciousness is the global workspace theory of consciousness the global workspace theory states that consciousness requires integrated information processing and this is made possible by cognitive architectures that involve a global workspace where information processed by various cognitive subsystems comes together is made globally accessible integrated and redistributed across subsystems the global workspace may thus act as a catalyst in this metamorphosis of wit putting together collective experiences and the phenomenological perceptions of these experiences 
and ratification is achieved through these repeated processes of simultaneous negation and affirmation. The procedural transformation of the wit into the unwit is therefore an elementary Aufhebung. And as we shall see later on, unwitification occupies the discursive plane of liminality in the collective subject's collective memory. We shall now look at how unwitification has been achieved in Josh Malaman's Bird Box. In Malaman's world, mankind has been infested with inhuman beings, referred to as creatures, who have the ability to insaniate any human who looks at them. Known as the problem, the humans who get in infected by this phenomenon transform into rabid, bloodthirsty lunatics, proceeding to kill each other and subsequently committing suicide. Aversion of such a fate requires the removal of the sensation of sight. Bereft of sight, the humans must now traverse this post-apocalyptic wasteland for survival, never knowing who or what lies ahead. The world thus becomes a very literal manifestation of the Heideggerian existential uncanny, thus Unheim Nish. The Malaman's humans are never comfortable in the world he created. They're never free of the anxiety that the Unheim Nish guide produces. Unwitification in this world is therefore generated through the arrival of the creatures and put into effect by the problem. Left without an emotional and spiritual safe space and unaltered home, their sanity disintegrates into oblivion. This unwitification is effectively a globalized collective phenomenon that affects all human subjects. The human beings of this world are unwitted by their invisible other. The other lacks the feeling of familiarity and homeliness that the human subjects desire a desire fundamentally caused by the very existence of the other. The creatures are never seen by those who are sane, since the sight of them is certain death. The rationally sound, unaffected people can neither perceive nor interact with the creatures. This imparts a sense of non-being to these creatures, a quality of absence. However, these same sensible and judicious humans, when they witness their sane brethren get affected and fall down the abyss of insanity, are forced to acknowledge the presence of these creatures, although indirectly and impersonally. The creatures thus transform into uncanny and unwitificationary beings themselves, and the sustenance of their paradoxical state of simultaneous presence and absence requires the genesis of the unificatory bond of intentionality. The intentional object remains elusive and lacking, and all forms of intelligent and rational apprehension of these objects seem dubious and iffy. The creatures of bird box may be considered in such a framework of intentionality, intentionality. They may very well be perceived as nothing less than intentional creatures. The onset of COVID-19 has transformed a familiar world into an uncanny, unhomely abode, similar to Malaman's world of bird box. Human beings are roaming this biological wasteland, physically masked, psychologically naked, and metaphorically blindfolded, never knowing when the virus shall infect them silently and without prior notice. The world and their very homes has become uncomfortable to live in. The virus itself is a burning reflection of Malaman's creatures. Biologically, viruses lack metabolism and are effectively strands of information that our body cells bring to life, information that we in turn share with one another as social beings. Their beingness is spatiotemporally temporary and fluctuates between two paradoxically dissimilar binaries. Their existence is as intentional as the hitherto mentioned intentional creatures of bird box. And ultimately, the beings they affect are literally lodged between ephemeral existence and sempiternal nothingness, between life and death. Now, we come to Rabindranath Thakur's short story, Khudita Pashan, which takes another important approach to denote this process of decay or unwitification as we have signified it to be. What Thakur shows in this story is a decay of memory, and it is indeed this decay that seems very relevant to present day occurrences, as we shall see later. Desire is something that fundamentally stems from, uh, stems from a lack, a not have, what Lacan refers to as manque. What constitutes this lack might be debatable, but as the narrator himself puts it, it might have been otripto bashuna, an unfulfilled desire for salvation. This desire now resides as a memory within the liminal spaces of the palace, waiting to catalyze a fundamental unwitification of being. These untold stories manifest in the form of untold and unfelt memories trapped inside the rooms of the palace. The building therefore becomes a very physical and architectural representation of remembrance and decay. 
and the canopsia that one experiences inside these walls is something that is indeed effectuated by these unidentificationary decay of memories. The memories of what was once a bustling palace, but now teeming with nothingness and replete with oblivion. The memory of perception is one of the interchangeable and supplementary notions of memory and imagination that Thakur employs in Kodita Bashan. The narrator recalls experiencing several visual, audio, and olfactory stimuli. All of these instances are indicatory of those events that come into existence when past memories and figments of imagination supplement themselves. What is perceived may not necessarily be limited to physical modes of perception, but may indeed be sensory independent, a property termed as supramodality. Those experiences that are qualitatively felt and not quantitatively experienced may give rise to this memory of perception too. One may be tempted to draw a line between the imaginary reality of the mind and the physical reality of perception, but as Tolving points out, reality of the mind is at least as important for human beings as is the physical reality. Memory affects imagination and conversely, imagination does the same. The conjugation of memory and desire effectuates the unwittification of being, being as in the self, the individual subject. This decay in the meaningful conception of the self is portrayed as a very literal decay from sanity to insanity. The imaginary memory of the Persian woman drives the narrator crazy with wanting, wanting as a form of nostalgic desire. The narrator's very identity is disintegrated. His, autobiograph his autobiographical memory is distorted. This phenomenon of memory distortion complements the formation of, of imaginary memory, driving forward the unwittification of being. Stuck within all these delusions, the local self feels in insignificant in the global context. It is trivialized and belittled until, until it has no real meaning in the grand design of events. Events that are presently occurring all around the world. The SARS-CoV-2 virus and all its various strains have stimulated and engendered globalized unwittification. Delocalized and therefore transnational and transcultural efforts are being made to contain its effects. However, as we shall see now, the extent of this globalized unwittification could have been restricted if only the collective subject had remembered about the occurrences of this phenomenon in the years past. To understand the conditions of our present-day corona-affected unwitted society, it is imperative that we first historicize the phenomenon of unwittification in times of pandemics. The collective memory has been amazingly forgetful when it comes to the recollection of medically important and significant historical events. Taking the example of the Spanish flu, we find that people never knew how to think about it. And even now, leaving aside the fields of medicine and virology, Ordinary commoners still do not have much root level understanding of it. Borrowing from the idea of imagination that Samuel Hines developed, the pandemic was thus never imagined sufficiently. This is very much in contrast to the collective memory. It's prevented the erasure of these memories and the collective subject still remembers sufficiently well the perils of the plague. However, the signification of the plague in the minds of the collective subject has not always been historically accurate. It has more often than not been dissolved into and merged with other strains of medical anomalies. Forgetfulness and, mis and misrepresentation is always tied to the phenomena of unbeautification, as we have seen before. Both of these qualities beget an unraveling of wit in the collective subject. So, um, so yeah. um, uh, just to interrupt, uh, you know, you just have two more minutes. So. Yeah, 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 okay, ma'am, I'll, I'll finish it like, yeah. Um, yeah, both of these qualities beget an unraveling of wit in the collective subject, no matter which temporal era it might reside in. Had we never experienced the obliviationary forces of this phenomenon, we might have been better prepared to handle the crisis we are facing presently, that of the COVID pandemic. Even looking at more recent cases of pandemics, we find that these events have always been either forgotten or trivialized in the collective memory. Furthermore, the pandemic itself has always been otherized by the local collective subject. Europeans tend under their cultural and geographical other and vice versa. The concern of the plague is now a concern of the otherized subject and not them. As a result of this, 
The memory of these plagues quickly dissolves from the memory of the European subject, and this act of forgetting renders them vulnerable to and unprepared for dealing with plagues and pandemics that might come their way later, such as the present COVID-19. Uh, there have been breaks in everyday rhythms all across the world. Working, educational, and domestic patterns of existence have merged into a single entity. Apart from these changes in spatiotemporal rhythms, uh, the unwittification brought into effect by the whole COVID situation has reopened fissures in meaning making. There has been an emerging discourse of renationalism brought on by the onset of the pandemic and fueled by the various organizations, public health officials, and political leaders all around the world who have described the virus as a foreign entity, thereby placing the pandemic as one caused by foreign invasion, leading to massive xenophobia among the masses. There have been various instances of racial stereotyping that bring back memories of the stereotyped yellow peril. There has also been a rise of groups which refute all the various scientific claims made by medical institutions and regulatory bodies, the most infamous of them being the anti-mask groups. Unbeautification of the collective subject does not necessarily annihilate instances of the collective subject completely. Rather, it culminates in an oblivion that possesses specters from the time before the unbeautification. And it is these specters that ultimately are responsible for the creation of newer instances of and in the collective subject. Unbeautification, therefore, leads to the creation of a liminal space where the collective subject resupposes itself. Studying these instances of unwittification would create firmer grounds for predicting the various patterns of the collective subject, further, uh, further enabling us to recognize and counter anomalies much more effectively. Uh, thank you. Uh, also, a special note of thanks to Avishta for helping me prepare this PPT in such short notice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, shall we move to the questions? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so this is a question from Juby. Uh, would you say a film like A Quiet Place would also be an appropriate example of unwittification, where people cannot make any sound because a blind creature with hypersensitive hearing would attack them then? Yeah, definitely. Even uh, there's a very famous video game, uh, Alien Isolation, which takes help of this similar kind of like a limitation of the senses in the sense that those creatures are hypersensitive to what, whatever uh, sounds or whatever things that we do. And so, yeah, it, it is a very good example of unwittification too. Okay, thank you. Also, uh, you have two more minutes, so I have a question. Uh, in a film like Bird Box, uh, how do you see memory in the process of effectuating unwitt unwittification? Um, okay. Um, in Bird Box, um, it's very honestly, Bird Box is uh, more about the concept of post memory in the sense uh, when uh, the girl, the main protagonist, she is the one who actually experienced the whole event that happened, the coming of the creatures per se. Her children never really got to experience anything uh, until the time when they actually had to go out into the world to survive and go to another safe space. They were never really, like not never really, they were never allowed to see anything outside their own homes. Like all they saw for the four years that they were like, they were born four years ago, like the, in the four years, all they saw were, were things inside their own homes. So they were very limited. They were almost blind to the outside world. And th they did not have any memory. Their, their memory came from uh, uh, the mother's, Mallory's description of things, description of things like sunlight, description of things like the, like trees, like, like fishes. Like the only animal they ever actually saw was a fish that Mallory had brought in. So, and she trained them through her descriptions, like how a certain animal makes this sound. It's a very, it's a very post memory, you know, it's a very post memory narrative that we see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So shall we move to the next speaker? If the chair doesn't have any questions or comments. I don't, I don't have any, any, any response to this. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So shall we move to the next speaker? Yes, yeah. So shall I introduce her? Or? Yes, yes, yes. 
So we have the next speaker, Sara Rizvi, uh, PhD scholar, Department of English, Jami Mila Islamia. And uh, she will be talking on exploring this topic, specialities of game play, a study of purpose, please, and over. Over to you, Sara. Thank you so much, Dr. Manoj. Just give me a second so I can share my screen and let me know if it's visible. It should be visible now. Yes, it is. Perfect. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, dystopian games. And whenever I talk about dystopian games, I make sure to share a gamer edition of a Brecht meme with you all. So let's start from there. In the dark times, will there also be gaming? Yes, there will also be gaming about the dark times. With that in mind, in an introduction to game studies, Franz Mayer talks about how the 20th and the 21st century childhood is increasingly affected by diminishing access to space and children remaining in constant protect protective custody. Digital games in their single player and online multiplayer varieties provide intensity of experience and escape from adult regulation that can fulfill some of the same roles the physical space used to have for previous generations." Unquote. There has been steadily and even more so over the recent years, the understanding of the world closing in, of space being cordoned off and perimeters being reduced considerably. Games with their long history of empowering social play seem to offer some solace, and not just in ways that are only relatable to childhood. MUDs, which are multi-user dungeons, dimensions, or domains, were born in the late 1970s, at the 70s, and uh, they were inspired by early text adventure games, roguelike games, and Dungeons and Dragons styles RPGs. An important part of the gameplay here was communication with other players and the capability to join character parties by tracking another player character. These small groups were more successful facing challenges than any single player would have been. The group of player characters was an important emergent gameplay feature, showing future directions for much of the later online game development. Multi-user games were often played out as escapist fantasies of survival in the offline world. With the emergent popularity of social simulation video games, possibilities of utopian alternative to the virtual online world increased. These games ranged from The Sims, My Sims, Tomodachi. There's a bunch of them, often on similar premises. And of course, we know Animal Crossing, that game of pandemic popularity. The idea is usually to create you, a better you in a better world version, and live a good life as the hero of your creation whatever that might mean. Now, of course, most of the people here today are aware of some of the underlying problems of these games. In a loving article called The Capitalist Joys of Animal Crossing, Nolan Gray describes the world of Animal Crossing as, I quote, a kind of egalitarian capitalist utopia of homeowners and shopkeepers, unquote. In another article, Think Animal Crossing is just a cutesy capitalist dystopia, think again. Amelia Tate lists out some of the charges against Animal Crossing, and she, tells us about how headlines have lamented it as a capitalist dystopia with a darkish underbelly and the game's raccoon overlord Tom Nook has been nicknamed a capitalist crook. And I'm not even going into the neo-colonialist trajectory of ACNH. Jason Flatt, in fact, if you're interested in that direction, has a great article called The Beginner's Guide to Anti-Colonialism in ACNH. And um, Flat describes how foreigners discovering remote islands, settling, exploiting their natural resources for profit, and acting as if there's nothing wrong with it all. Now that sounds familiar, right? So it's because the premise of ACNH, he says, is the age old story of capitalism. And then we have what can be called in the words of Lucas Pope, new, explore new explorations of other people's simulators, games that reveal that the physical shrinking of space can no longer be compensated by expansive gamescapes. These are serious, uncomfortable games characterized by a suffocating hypernearing of the experience of the dystopia. Colin Campbell calls this gaming's new frontier, where interestingly, there's a painful absence of power that games usually attributed to the players. I'm reading from the slide now, while games have traditionally endowed the player with a host of impressive fantasy powers, these games show how their creators cope with real life difficulties, often with the limited ability to change. In demonstrating specific challenges via game mechanics, they allow us to walk in other people's shoes. Developers are showing a deeper understanding that by connecting the player with the storyteller through actions, as opposed to the anecdote, confession, or demonstration of more linear forms, they can convey strong feelings or empathy in unique ways. Papers, Please, a dystopian document thriller, is a 2013 puzzle simulation video game by Lucas Pope. The game places the player at a migration checkpoint of a fictional dystopian Eastern Bloc-like country as an immigration officer. 
The game starts when you, a person living in the country of Artotska, with your family, are drawn in a labor lottery that places you in the Ministry of Admission at the Greston border checkpoint. Here you live a very disembodied existence in a small cabin of sorts where you have access to various documents on a table and the wall opposite the checkpoint window. All that the game shows you is right now on your screens. Um, there's a bird's eye view of a small piece of land that shows an endless line of ant-like figures of people waiting outside your booth and a handful of guards on either side of the border. border. This view doesn't change throughout the game, except for the event in which there's a performance of violence, which brings with it a conversion of the gaze, so often seen in the development of, dy of the dystopian protagonist, but also a part of the articulation of the Nicanthropus scene, as Stiegler outlines in his conceptualization of the term. Now I know Joff has already spoken a bunch of about Siegel and whatever I say will really not be up to the point. But for those who are uh, new to the term, it's there on the slide right now and you can have a look. Uh, for most part of the game, Papers, Please places us in the dead end banality of the Anthropocene. The visuals remain the same, lending a suffocating horror to the very close space the player can occupy, which continues to increase as the player progresses along the 31 day length of the game. The visuals are minimalist, bleak, despairing, and frustrating, and the color palette of the game is pale and warm, saturated with greens and browns, and the non-player characters are muddy, impressionistic figures built of splotchy pixel art. This dedication to inoffensive, subdued, and largely static visuals reflect the mess of the bureaucratic exactitude seen in the player characters' instructions. I'm quoting here the Gamsberg's analysis for this game, which really looks at the game closely from the point of visuals to discuss the spatiality of the game. The sameness of the visuals begins to get more and more frustrating and fearful as symbols, photos, documents, texts begin to emerge and small differences slip under the radar at the cost of lives. As what seems on the surface then to be a design choice geared towards evocation of boredom actually manages to heighten the tension and difficulty of the task at hand. The first few days of the game are pretty simple. We have a small set of rules with which we compare the passports and required entry documents of the people who come to visit the booth. At this juncture, the responsibilities of the player are to continue on this routine of unexcitable tasks, checking documents and stamping the passports in a time-bound fashion, which rewards speed, uh, which rewards speed and punishes in inaccuracy. The credits you earn mean a lot because of the family you have to support. You have to pay the rent, feed your family, and unfortunately, your family is always cold and or sick, meaning you're always worried whether you'll be uh, earning enough to keep all of your family surviving. However, there is a danger to the stasis which could lull you into metamorphosizing into an automata automation and the game with its frequent calls to your empathy fights against this automization of the player. Then, the political situation begins to get grimmer as the relations between Artsotska and the neighboring countries continue to remain strained. Accordingly, new and numerous rules begin to get added and soon there isn't enough space on your small crowded desk to check various documents. You want to make sure you admit the correct people, not just for the safety of your country, but also to avoid citations which reflect the money you earn and people begin to resemble each other. And uh, after a point, they are just different points of information that you have to tally. And immigrants start to resemble the documents, passports, ID cards, work permits, immigration forms, vaccination records, and they have you that they give you, and you try to focus on quick reflexes in what seems like a never ending repetitive sequence. This is around the time the game begins to play back. The most dialogueless characters now begin to offer you their stories rather than just the information. A wife gets left behind, a criminal has all the right paperwork, uh, but a woman who will certainly die the next day doesn't have the paperwork. So who will you let through? Will you focus on stories rather than information? These contradictions continue to pile up in more and more ambiguous, morally ambiguous scenarios. Sergio Walda is one of them. Uh, and his story with Elisa is one of the nicest parts of this game, but it is also there to confuse you. Uh, Walda will come to you at one point of time and say that he has a favor to ask. He's a friend, he's helped you before, and um, he loves a beautiful girl. She's lost her family, but she doesn't have documents to really enter um, the nation. And um, when you finally meet El Elisa, she really doesn't have these documents. And now you, the girl with the controller states the dilemma of every player at this instance when she says that you should deny her. The game has taught you this. And do you put a stranger above your family? Do you risk a citation? Or is reuniting a woman with the only person she has left worth it? If you decide to let her pass, you see her and Sergio run to each other, as you can see on the screen. And this is one of the rewarding moments if you do want to take that path. 
And then we come to the case of ESIC, the secret organization that wants your help to take over our source code to build a better country. And it's yet another case of the kind of morally ambiguous scenarios you are continuously participating in. And all the while you are aware that time is ticking, just like just like right now. And whatever choice you make that uh, that diverges you from the rules, you make them at the cost of you, you and your family's lives. Not only does your personal situation get worse with relatives dying, but also the people at the checkpoint continue to overload you with personal stories, steadily making it difficult for you to robotically follow orders. At the same time, the recurring presence of ESIC, the rebel group, and the dehumanizing tools of our source code continuously make you rethink what's good for the people of this territory. In the background of this movement limiting, choice limiting, empathy demanding gameplay, there is no accompanying music for the most part. A distorted, mechanical, retro robotic sound calls out the next person in line, and then you have a whole rhythm of paper shuffling and stamp sounds. Uh, and after a, a time, they begin to resemble a never ending horror, mimicking the dull, inhuman task of the player. The airy silence and repetitive predictability of sounds and visuals of the game are punctured with explosions, blood, alarm sounds, and gunshots. Interestingly, when you're off work, music returns to your ears. However, this music is usually the equally airy, our thoughts can anthem. Fair language, lightly accompanied, best of one note, moving one octave up and one down, in martial determination at infinitum. As your limited actions become sloppy and the paranoia of seeing the citation increases, you are forced to think about what could be a good ending, what could make you a hero. The orality of the game supplements and even foregrounds its frustrations, but there is also a growing interest to continue and maneuver the rules to different advantages. There are officially 20 possible endings for the game and you have to replay various days to reach each and every ending. Uh, most of the time for 17 out of 20 endings, you will get the death theme to play at the end, which shows that you've lost the game. In three endings at the end, which is the endings on the slide, 18, 19 and 20, you will hear the victory theme. So let me just skip over a lot and come to this. So you can uh, either migrate to Obristan and probably that seems a victory for now, or you can allow Ezek to win and a new Asoska is formed. Or at the end, which surprisingly is also called a victory, is when the checkpoint reopens again and the game continues till infinity. And that's it for the endings. But before we move on to Orville, let's just look at some of the important points about the ending. So these endings also make clear some of the gravest problems of the Anthropocenic dystopia, that there is finally all about us, evidence of a deterioration of political faith, belief, trust, hope, and will, and a corresponding rise of a desperate reactionary and xenophobic anti-politics, all too willing to designate scapegoats and appeal at every opportunity to fear and stupidity. I'm of course uh, quoting Siegel's translator Ross. And now we come to Orville. Orville Keeping an Eye on You is also an episodic simulation game, which makes some of the concerns of Papers, Please, uh, more overt. Orwell takes place in a country called The Nation, led by a dystopian authoritarian government known as The Party. At the very start of the game, we know that our play is possible because of a safety bill passed by the party in 2012, which allows the government to spy on its citizens in the name of national security. As part of this bill, the Ministry of Security built a covered surveillance system called Orwell, which is operated by sourcing people from outside the nation. Orwell presents a dystopia of techniques in a surprisingly mundane way. At the start of the game, the player is a CCTV camera looking at people in the Freedom Plaza, trying to identify suspects, even though at this moment, there is nothing to suspect anyone of. This convergence of the human player with the technological surveillance apparatus is telling as it establishes the upcoming demands that will be made of this player, as well as the early reduction of the player to a simple, small, and replaceable part of the tech system in place in the nation. Orwell's approach to immersion in video games is mind-boggling in that by using a computer screen as the game's interface, it puts the player in exactly the same position as the character they're playing, a person sitting at a computer browsing its contents. Sahara, mind... please wind up. You just left with one minute and 20 seconds. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, yes, let's go to the next slide. So this is the kind of information that you, you look at. You look at people's bank statements, their health records and so on. And you try to see even Facebook records. You try to see who could be a suspect in a crime that hasn't taken place. And when the crime does take place, you immediately put that person as a suspect of that crime. And people lose their uh, jobs, their lives. But uh, all it appears to you is 
a point in information chain and the delay in the realization that uh, you could have gone back and made changes even if it's a choice limiting game is frustrating as one realizes that the mnemonic tech and devices of industrialized tertiary retention have immersed us hijacked our attention and seized control of our behavior algorithmically and telecratically which is also we realize what is happening to the people inhabiting the nation in the game and unlike papers please one just can't replay a day one has to carry it through to the end uh, despite there being no reward or uh, punishment Yes, and then we come to the endings. If you're on the last day, you seem to be presented with a few endings depending on how you've played the game. So you can either incriminate uh, the protest group, or you can incriminate the minister of security, or you can incriminate yourself, depending on uh, the kind of decisions you have made previously. But you really can't go back and play. You have to play the whole game again. And what's really interesting, I feel, about these endings is that the fan communities ha that have come up. in rethinking the kind of endings that can take place and thinking about the idea of a good ending they are also negotiating with the dead end penalty of a lot of anthropocenic dystopias that are coming up and this is the direction which this paper seeks to take ultimately and um, it's very interesting that this paper was actually developed out of a very discussion based game studies in india talk i did last month so Tom. yes i'm sure you can see the direction where it's going thank you so much for your patience Yeah. So, shall we go quickly take the questions? Do you see Zara? Yeah. yeah. Do you see this kind of uh, player experience as breaking with the tradition of immersion in gaming in favor of something comparable to Brett alienation effect, particularly in its compelling of the viewer to participate in and criticize the world outside the game, particularly given Brett's own opposition to naturalist theater? absolutely there is a reason why i share the brex meme every time i talk about these games it's just so perfect and it sets the mood and i feel sameer has totally hit the nail on his he head when he's made this comment excellent reaction and this makes me really happy you have one more question uh, from ruchi could you comment on how the simulated environment of the game space contradicts or supplements the reality Yes, so the game is supposed to, according to the game designers, to. Uh, by the way, Orwell game designers are actually for uh, fans of Papers Please. That's why there's so much comparison and mirroring. So they really did try to create this game, looking at dystopic um, simulation and dystopic spatialities, and uh, they are still surprised. I follow them on Twitter, and they keep saying the world seems to just follow their script. So even they won't be able to really answer which followed what. but uh, there is of course an immense interaction with reality with virtuality but that goes beyond just these games virtuality seems to seems to be putting reality to shape sometimes by predicting the future you have a last question uh, from a uh, this is by manish solanki from a pedagogic point of view has this kind of studies of video game been prescribed at university level for pg courses if you know any of such a case I would love if there were more courses. Please call me if there are. <laughs> But uh, I would advise you to check out Game Studies India. That's where I spoke, and I shouldn't really be talking about other people right now. But yes, since you asked for recommendation. Okay, so we are done with the question. Over to the chair for further questions. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. It was quite expected, and it was a brilliant paper. Even though I was not too familiar with the games that you are talking about, but. Uh, it it resonated in me like the conversation that we had in our workshop where when we conducted a workshop with Jamia especially on Stiegler video games and other stuff. Yes. Uh, it was nice listening to you again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. So we will go on to the next speaker. I think nice. last speaker of the session. Yes. Yeah. We have Pavel Mikna, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, PhD scholar from Faculty of Polish. studies jagalonian university krakow poland uh, the presentation is titled special poems on planetary communication through multi sensory artistic performance over to you babu uh hello it's great to be here uh, unfortunately virtual uh, um yeah and i will try to share my screen uh okay Is the presentation visible? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. So I will start. Um, 
reflection of on art changed with the global uh, social and economic transformation in the second uh, half of the 20th century, especially after 1989. The issue of globalization and the phenomena connected with it quickly became important topic also for artists and uh, art history scholars. And these problems found expression in the field of art history um, in the criticism of uh, the dominance of the Western-centric view of the art. However, artistic activities posing question about the changing face of the modern world uh, had appeared long before, at the time when the globalized world was only taking shape. Um, in this paper, I would like to analyze one of such works, a um, special poem by Japanese artist Mieko Shiomi, um, it was um, a series of nine events, activities to be performed according to instructions uh, sent by post. Uh, they took place between uh, 1965 and 1975 uh, uh, and were performed by many uh, participants around the globe at the same time. Um, these events organized by Xiaomi uh, bear a resemblance to the performance of the international artist group Fluxus, but what distinguished the artist activity and makes the spatial poem um, a serious pioneering in is the fact that it takes up the subject of the global transformations and the resulting need to formulate a new transcultural way of communication. In my presentation, I would like to show show me work as a proposal to create a dialogical exchange of experience between people uh, by means of the universal language of art, which goes beyond the borders of countries and cultures. And practically in the whole output of Miko Shiomi, um, composer and performance artist born in 1938, the issue of time, space, and the sensual experiencing them can be noticed. From the beginning of 1960s, she used written instructions as Fluxus artist, although Xiaomi herself was unaware of this parallel. Um, American artist George Brecht was the person who introduced the term event to describe this type of activity in 1959. In describing the term event, uh, he indicated his interest in the total multi-sensory experience that could emerge from the situation. Um, the simplicity of events written in the form of textual instructions, as Fluxus uh, performance researcher Catherine Stiles points out, opened those actions to virtually infinite possibilities of, of realization. Um, Shomi independently also came to similar conclusions and uh, following, uh, I quote, directions that recall philosophical uh, description of phenomenological character of the body as an instrument acting in the world. Uh, in June 1964, Shomi went to New York. She quickly be began to take part in the intense New York art life. And at that time, a new aspect started more prominently appearing in the, her works uh, and, and opening to the viewer as an inherent um, part of the event. Uh, he or she um, was not just, just a passive observer, but, uh, but a creative participant with whom the performer communicates. The event started to become a place of encounter by showing many different realization of the same instruction by the participants the artist put emphasis on the diversity of the or, as, as a constitutive feature of human collectivity uh, perhaps it was a trip to new york that sensitized her to the presence of the other not without influence was also her participation in the fluxus community which was multicultural, multinational, multiracial, and included more women than most avant-garde before it. Although they warmly welcomed her, she was still an immigrant um, to have um, experienced the disadvantages of being a foreigner. Uh, it uh, may have also influenced the artist's sensitivity to the issue of the other that she herself was. A special poem itself was a reaction to the necessity to leave New York and the impossibility of continuing a direct creative exchange with um, Fluxus artists. 
in the wake of her departure, the artist began to recognize the problem of being physically restrained uh, to one place at uh, a time. Upon her return to Japan, it enabled her to continue to communicate artistically. The instructions for the first event in, in the World Series, entitled World Event, uh, which you saw on the previous slide, um, which um, took place in 1965, was sent by the author to 100 people, mostly the Fraxis artists. The instructions stated, write a word or words on the enclosed card and place it somewhere. Please tell me the word and the place, which will be edited on the word map. Um, after the action, the artist made a documentation of it in the form of a simple object. It was a rectangular slab of styrofoam with a map on the of the world glued to its surface. Places of participants' performances were marked by the stacked flag uh, with printed answer on it. Uh, the map contained only the counters of the continents. No national borders, no names of places were drawn on it. It was as neutral as possible. Flags were pointing to a specific location of the event of the even white um, surface. Uh, in the next 10 years, the artist conducted more events of spatial poem. You can see them on this uh, uh, slide. Uh, a total of about 232 people from 26 countries participated. Apart from the medium of mail and the freedom of realization of instruction given to the participants, all parts of the cycle are linked by the focus of the performance, sensually perceived environment, and the dynam dynamics of the process occurring in it. They refer to ordinary natural phenomena resulting from the laws of physics and being an element of everyday human life. Artists draw attention to it and elevates them to the status of an extraordinary event. All of them are oriented towards activating multiple senses, whether by sight, hearing, or touch. Um, by pointing to um, the universal and commonplace phenomena, the artists open her instructions um, to potentially every person in the world. Within the event, all participants are equal. The flag stack on the map stands for the same equally valuable point of on Earth, regardless of whether it's New York, Russia, India, or the island on an island in the Pacific Ocean. Answers become a poetry as in, uh, intended, by, and by bringing them together in the documentary and artifact, we can look at it as a one collective poem. Um, sub uh, subsequently, the docu um, do documentation of the work created by the artist took on various on various forms. Um, final from um, um, was the book published by Xiaomi uh, in 1960 in 1976, which sums up the whole cycle. Similarly to the first event's uh, documentation presents all of the lands as on earth as uniform structure uh, marked with the same color and not divided by uh, any way. The event's documentation show a poetic work created by many people coming from different backgrounds and cultures and wh whose response is arguably mediate, mediated by the individuality, culture, and all the diverse physical environment in which they perform uh, the instruction. In this sense, it real, realized localness. Simultaneously, utilizing an envelope with the postage stamps allow performers to express themselves on the same basis. Place marked on map become um, successive verses of the global poem, becoming equal points. Thus, it has a global character. The whole constitutes a dialogic exchange between the participants and the artist, and also uh, between the performers and uh, between the viewer and both the artist and the individual participants. But making visible both similarities and differences of the answers, and consequently of the sensitive or, or sensitivity of contributor, Xiaomi acts against the stereotyping of the other. And the artist herself described the actions she organized as follows. 
I quote, the reports returned by various people are very diverse and full of individuality, some poetic, some realistic or cynical, some artificial, some spontaneous. Uh, when they are uh, collected together, they present a fantastic panorama of human attitudes. I would like to think that um, collective anonym, the collective anonymous, anonymous poem can be preserved as a monument for the people of the 30th century if we survive um, that long. Although skeptical about the future of the human species, Xiaomi uh, created a kind of horizontal panorama of diversity, which at the same time showed that all people, uh, though different from each other, are sensitive and capable of reflections, members of one collective. To achieve this, she used a metaphor, openness for interpretation of instruction, has lifted the limitations of language, just as the use of male, male ha has lifted the limitations of space uh, and the difficulty of crossing borders. The author proposed a metaphorical form of communication to the world full of diversity. This exchange occurs across borders, understood bo both as the physical borders of countries and cultural differences. Uh, the poetic the dialogue um, uh, she proposed thus can be viewed as emerging from the planetary perspective. One that according to Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak is opposite to global. The globe is on, I quote, the globe is on com uh, our uh, computers. No one lives there. It allows us to think that we can aim to control it. Um, changing an approach require us imagine, I quote, imagine ourselves as planetary subjects rather than global agents, planetary creatures rather, rather than global entities. Um, then it allows us to change the way we view our relationship with the world and, and how it is organized. Negating the gl uh, global perspective and un um, unmapping the planet is meant to leave it open to new social connections and political possibilities. In this sense, Xiaomi work can be viewed precisely as an, an archaeology of planetarity that sought to look at humanity beyond the global divisions that were forming. Special poem attempt to unmap a world atlas based on the national borders on, and, uh, and other divisions to be able to see on the planet from the different, more holistic point of view. Uh, show me aspiration to build a global panorama of human sensitivity created um, through un unhindered uh, self-expression se seems to be utopian assumption. The artist builds, builds an alternative community of uh, world citizens that becomes possible by breaking the abstract vision of the other in favor of uh, communication with specific individuals. Uh, uh, yeah. just, to, just to warn you, there are, there's, oh, you're left with two minutes. Thank you, I, I'm finishing. Uh, her proposition can be seen as uh, what Polish history theorist Eva Domańska call, call responsible utopia. Domańska, in opposition to futuristic visions of the distant future, advocates for searching for the germs of realistic utopias in the world around us. She sees a vital role in creating such concepts in contemporary art. Even though these utopian projects can happen only on a micro scale, they show the conditions for the formation of desirable in, in interpersonal relation and can be an example of a prefigurative social practice. Shami demonstrated a the utopian model of des desirable social practice, the metaphorical language of art as a means of communication between people regardless of any categorization project on a relatively small scale, but encompassing the entire planet and the universal because it's referred to the human basic sensual experience of the surrounding environment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we shall quickly take the question. Uh, so uh, it was a stimulating paper, Pavel. Uh, can you dwell on, this is from Shraddha, can you dwell on these spatial poems as transcending anthropocentrism in spite of the fact that they were composed and contained semiotic signification? Okay. Uh, um... 
transcending anthropocentrism uh, as a mm, kind of difficult uh, question. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, if I may be allowed to speak, yeah, clarify a little bit. Would that be okay with the chair? Yes, sure. I'm not sure if it's. it's I, cannot hear. I can see Manoj speaking, but I cannot hear anything he's saying. I said, I said, go ahead. Yes, please. Yeah. I don't know what somehow. The... Thank you, thank you. I really, really loved your paper. What I was looking, I mean, when you were speaking, I was thinking of, you know, when you're talking about the articulations that were made through these poems, I was thinking about the fact that they were projected in a future moment, you know, and in that future moment uh, where you discussed how the planetary relations evolved, at that moment, I could think of these post-human articulations. I mean, uh, it's a, it, and you're right, you know, it's a complex concept to kind of grapple with, which is yeah. why I'm thinking of, you know, how these poems, in spite of the fact that they've been worded and they've been composed and, you know, there are significations in them, how are they really, I mean, if at all, are they challenging the centrality of the human in spite of the fact that we are the ones who are creating them, you know? So that's the kind of question that I really wanted to ask. Yeah, on, from, from one point, yes, but still, it's it's very you know uh, very uh, uh, focused on uh, the human. I may, may say humanism. Yeah, the she used this uh, concept of the uh, the making monuments for the. Human of the uh, 13th century, so it's like uh, uh, 13, so it's like more. It, I think it's more humanistic uh, than than uh, like um, transcending anthropocentrism, uh, and but still, yeah, it's it it's less individual focus on the individuality. It's more like treating the planet as a whole. So from this perspective, it can be uh, see like something like prefigurating some uh, concepts, but still it was uh, made, uh, invented in 1965. So um, I use the term of uh, archeology span of planetarity because it's, it's very early work with in in the in the, when you consider the uh, art history even um, which focus on the don, on the on these issues but um, yeah and and still it's i in my understanding it's long before the concept of, of uh, um, uh, anthropocentrism uh, emerge uh, so I think maybe some we can see as like, like the, the, the sparks, like something which prefigurate the ideas, but still it's very, it's deep in, 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 in humanism. Uh, uh, when we consider the, the, the idea um, of uh, um, the main idea, I, I don't know if I answer your question, oh. but. Um, I, I think it is interesting because it's it's really early example of thinking of all of the planet as a whole uh, in in the in the field of art, um, and from this perspective, yeah, it, it can be seen as prefiguration, but not maybe not something like which transcending anthropocentrism. You know, you could think of oh, about this question maybe later. Uh, you can ponder about it. Uh, so we move to the next question uh, by Professor Zeno Ackerman. Uh, he says uh, he is more uh, interested in the relationship between mapping and unmapping. Uh, do, uh, do not the spatial poems do both at the same time? Uh, could you briefly comment on this? Uh, yes, yes. Um, uh, in this unmapping, I uh, think it's unmapped the uh, uh, 
the, um, in the borders of, of, of the map, the, on, the, on the map, the borders, the, uh, it makes the, and Wafri, you are com completely right. It makes the map, uh, but the map of the whole planet and unmap the, the borders, the differences uh, uh, to make the planet as a co coherent, the, the, the sphere, one sphere, not, 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 so yeah, you are completely right. In, in this unmapping, I, uh, I um, according to, to, to to Spivak, it's like more uh, unmap the global uh, the, the global the divisions and the global thinking uh, to the more uh, unified uh, uh, perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Any questions or comments from the chair? Yeah, I was also thinking about the same line ah. what Brother was uh, articulating. Basically, when you are talking about uh, sort of uh, multi-sensory effects and all, right? You know, so like uh, sort of becoming going beyond the, the anthropocentrism, and and also when I was listening to your uh, your presentation, I felt like uh, was thinking of like the schizo possibilities that art contains. In that in that sense, I would like to. Uh, I uh, that's how I read it. Like in that, even though like the place of occurrence or the the context in which this happened. Uh, maybe of certain other other parameters, but of course the possibilities of that might be completely different. Like you know, so I also like from what I heard of you, I I thought the same way. I think especially the effects and the the multi sensory or what you call an alien phenomenology or something like that, like something other than human. Yeah, yeah and I don't have uh, enough time, but. Uh, uh... Uh, you know the other series of spatial poem was like the uh, even if you um, uh, read only instructions, it was the uh, sound event, the wind event, the disappearing event, the falling event, and for example, the um, the sound event and the instruction was at the time listed simultaneously is listen to the sound around you. Uh, and the other event was uh, open event was open something which is closed. So it was very uh, open, uh, open, uh, so to say. Uh, but uh, uh, for the for this, uh, um, also both uh, your sense, sensitive senses or, or experience, sensual experience, but also to your. A whole environment. Uh, so, so maybe it will be more if I have time to um, show you those other events. It will be more um, uh, visible that it's very multi-sensory in, in idea idea in this in, in, in this instructions. Thank you. Thank you for that insightful discussion. Uh, I think uh, without any further questions or comments, I mean, we can formally conclude this session. Uh, I thank Dr. Manoj Envai for being associated with this conference. Uh, I thank Professor Zeno Ackerman, Professor Simi Malhotra, Professor Nishad Zaidi, Shraddha and Spark Department. We don't uh, call it a day because we have yet another session, uh, another stimulating session at three. So we break for lunch and we meet again at three with uh, Professor Ananya Jahanara Kabir and Ari Gautier. And uh, just in case we have our YouTube channel where all lectures and all the sessions are available, please make sure you subscribe to the channel and share with your friends. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was, it was absolutely nice uh, to be with you, all of you, like you, know, especially associated with Jami and that of being part of the centenary celebrations once more, like you know, contributing to the Jami activities. It was so kind of you for inviting me to chair this session and thanks for inviting me for the plenary as well. Fantastic, Manoj. Thank you so much. Do join us again if you find the time. I know I mean there's a time difference, but yeah, I mean it was fantastic to hear you and, and I'm sure there'll be an occasion for us to hear you more again yeah. sometime with a greater definitely. I'll be I'll be joining definitely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. You, you can stop